passage tonight, right? Yep. So we need the mirrors. Everybody here, cause LHS is gonna give it to you. That's the old school. Yeah, you think I knew that? Yeah, that's right, boy. Great job. May 17th, 2021 meeting, or rather 2022 meeting of the city council is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Will do. Alderman Redpath. Here. Alderman Gregory. Here. Alderman Williams. Here. Alderman Fulgenzi. Here. Alderwoman Purchase. Here. Alderwoman DeCenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderwoman Connolly. Present. Alderman Donlin. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mayor Langfelder. Here. Mr. Mayor, a quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, the first item on the zoning agenda is docket number 2022-019. For the property located at 3229 West Street, petitioner is Jonathan Sanders, present zoning classification R1, single family residence district, section 155.016. Requested zoning relief a variance of section 155.068 a garages or accessory buildings or structures to allow construction of a detached garage 20 foot by 30 foot on an existing pad located approximately 17 feet from the front line Instead of the 30 feet required and section 155.062 c1 permitted obstructions and required yards to allow the garage as a permitted obstruction in the front yard setback Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is approval as submitted. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff. Chair will entertain a motion. I make a motion that we accept it as submitted. Second motion. Been moved and second to accept the petition as submitted and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, uh, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the zoning request passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2022-020 for the property located at 1510 North 15th Street. Petitioner is Tiny Hands LLC. Present zoning classification at S2 Community Shopping and Office District Section 155.031. Requested zoning relief a variance of Section 155.095K. Required accessory off-street parking spaces, community facilities uses commercial day care center to allow for less than one parking spot for each 100 square feet of square foot frontage an approximate number of nine proposed parking spaces plus two in the garage or the number of deemed appropriate instead of the 17 required spaces section 155.111 access to off street parking facilities to allow backing into the street or alley section 155.114b Regulations for the location of accessory off-street parking facilities to allow parking in the front yard and section 155.480 I1 Landscape screening and lighting regulations transitional buffer yard requirement and landscaping to allow for the south property line Transitional buffer yard depth to be zero feet instead of the 10 feet required Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is approval as submitted. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff. Shall we entertain a motion? I make a motion that we approve as recommended. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve as recommended by the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff. And second, any discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. I do get. <clears throat> and the uh, ordinance request or zoning request passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2022-021 for the property located at 
802 through 828 South 11th Street, tenant spaces 812, 816, 820 South 11th Street. Petitioner is Bishop Properties, Inc. President's Zoning Classification S2, Community Shopping and Office District, Section 155.031. Requested zoning relief, a conditional permitted use pursuant to Section 155.031C7. Conditional permitted uses in the S2, Community Shopping and Office District, Restaurants with the service of alcoholic beverages located on a zoning lots adjoining the R1, R2, or R3 zoning districts or equivalent PUD designation or otherwise adjoining those districts but for an alley except for the driveway or drive up windows for the sale of alcohol. And section 155.211, restaurants with the service of alcoholic beverages and a variance of section 155.211B restaurants with the service of alcoholic beverages to allow the establishment within 100 feet of a church, school, commercial daycare center, park, or community facility. And section 155.187C3, general conditions to allow a restaurant with alcoholic services, which the vehicular entrance or exit is within 100 feet of any exit or entrance for a school except trade schools for adults, and playground accessory thereto or any non-commercial park or playground, one half acre or more, church or other house of worship or daycares in the area. Relief requested in the petition is to be limited to tenant spaces identified as 812, 816, and 820 South 11th Street, that area being an approximate measurement of 100 feet by 50 feet, approximately 5,000 square feet. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is approval of the request conditional permitted use provided that number one, the restaurant is limited to no more than 5,000 square feet total in tenant spaces 812, 816, and 820 South 11th Street as described in the petition and its exhibits. And number two, the hours of operation are limited to the hours of specified in the city liquor license. The proposed restaurant's main entrance will be located in excess of 100 feet from the existing daycare to the north. Recommend approval of the requested variances of section 155.211B and 155.187C3. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendations is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff. Chair will entertain a motion. Motion to accept staff recommendation. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded to accept the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Plan Planning Staff recommendation and seconded. Any discussion? No. All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. And the zoning request passes nine voting yes, one voting present. And that concludes our zoning portion of the meeting. This time, the uh, chair recognizes Treasurer Busher for the presentation of the financial report. Thank you, Mayor Langfelder. The corporate fund in the month of April had a beginning balance of $52,911,323. We took in total receipts of $9,806,316. We had total disbursements in the month of April of $13,579,189, which left the corporate fund with an ending balance of $49,138,450. Of that balance, Mayor Langfelder, your ARPA fund balance included in that was $14,359,607. This concludes my report, Mayor Langfelder. Thank you. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Yeah. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Well, we're fortunate today to have um, the Springfield Lucky Horseshoe owners with us. That's uh, Melissa Gaynor, Jamie Toole, and Jeff Jarrett. And if you'd like to come forward and uh, introduce yourselves, we appreciate it. And we appreciate your interest uh, uh, in Springfield and your investment, and most importantly, your passion for the uh, Springfield Lucky Horseshoes. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I've never met a microphone I didn't enjoy getting in front of. So <laughs> uh, Jeff Jarrett here is a WWE Hall of Famer and also a big uh, Springfield Lucky Horseshoe guy. Uh, who knew? You can't tell by the physique and uh, Melissa Gaynor. So part of our eight-person ownership group, and we're fortunate to be in Springfield. So uh, we are not natives, but boy, have we had a horseshoe or four or five or six. I always say I'm a Florida large and uh, an Illinois extra large. So that's the savory food. So uh, we don't want to take much time because I know you guys got a lot of business, but we're just thankful to be here. 
Uh, we look forward to creating a brand and a team that our community can be proud of. Uh, I think we've already started that um, with all due respect to our predecessor. Um, our Lucky Horseshoes is all encompassing and we're very excited about the direction. Uh, season tickets are well over 300. Ticket sales are coming. Uh, the promotional schedule is packed. I actually brought you this hot off the presses. Right. So if you can't find something there that you enjoy, then uh, let me know. We'll put it in there for next year. So we'll leave the schedules and look forward to meeting you guys. And we're available. We're here. We're present. Um, it'll be another three months before we head back to West Palm Beach. So uh, the weather, thankfully, has finally turned in our favor. So any questions about the ownership group? Just wanted to come say hello and just tell you how much we appreciate being here. Congratulations. Thank you. Welcome. Alderman McMinima. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to find the right button to push to, to be able to speak. But um, wh when's your opening night? Could you tell us when your opening night and do you have any special uh, situations? Sure. Well, we got lots of situations, but special, I don't know. <laughs> opening night is June 4th. I think we're 18 days away from that. Um, we have uh, some fireworks shows. My personal favorite is we have the human cannonball, Dave the Bullet Smith, who shoots himself out of a cannon. I tried to get Mayor Langfield to do that, but he said no. <laughs> um, yep. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, we have the Pony Shoes Kids Club for kids. We have the Silver Shoes for seniors. I, I think you'll find programming for pretty much anyone in our community. So Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ev evidently, they didn't raise enough money to shoot me out of the cannon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're council. still working on that. So. <laughs> so. But actually, uh, what we'd be interested in is a, uh, we used to do a city-county softball game on a Sunday. Yeah. So if that's ever an opportunity... Uh, I heard the I think county we were was talking the, uh, some stuff. So I think we're the reign city's of won the last two games. That's right. Oh, there you. I love the competitiveness. Any first pitches here, too, so we're always looking for those if mm -hmm. anybody wants to. We're going to go live, too, so make sure you practice. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Jeff, anything? Any other? Oh, oh very good. Yeah, well, I'm yep. happy to speak. Put a microphone to me, and uh, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> no, I was just sitting here thinking, uh, this is my, obviously my first any council meeting in Springfield, but when I walk in, uh, I see those shades, so I kind of already feel like the community people say, you're never really going to go up to Springfield. And I said, oh, yeah, I go every month. So uh, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the city already embracing. We had to even have our first game. Uh, but every week I get checkups from him, and, and just it's one good story <laughs> after another after another. So we're here. We're here for the long haul. We're looking forward to uh, 30 games uh, this summer. Uh, we're going to have a lot more. Uh, we're going to have some special events uh, come September and October after the season's over. So we're very, very excited. And uh, like Jamie said, thanks uh, for, for having us, Mayor. Uh, we've got to know Mayor uh, qu quite a bit, uh, and uh, we appreciate just everything you guys have done thus far. So looking forward to seeing everybody at the ballpark. Thanks. Yeah, we appreciate the excitement you bring, especially that area. The whole uh, North Grand Corridor is going to change, of course, Lamphere High School. Uh, you're embracing Robin Roberts Stadium for the nostalgia and then Pillsbury, a lot of activity. So you look at that whole corridor, and that's going to dramatically change uh, through the next few years, um, thanks to your investment as well. So I, I think you'll like what you see at Robin Roberts Stadium. We've mm -hmm. invested quite a, a bit in getting that place shined up a little bit, and the history and tra tradition is impeccable. Um, it's just an amazing place with so much history. Uh, often I'll go sit down and realize Satchel Page set in those same bleachers and stands, which is just incredible. So as our community, I hope they'll embrace that history as we kind of bring it back to life. If you want to hand out those schedules, feel free yeah, to. Yeah, do that. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Good mayor. Alderman Gregory. Good mayor. Oh, Alderman Gregory, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I just want to say thank you guys for coming and, um, you know, taking over ownership in Springfield. I didn't know the uh, previous owner, Todd, and he was a good guy. He, he cared about that baseball team in that stadium, and um, he, he gave it all. So I'm, I'm happy that you guys came in. And, you know, before you go, I, I, rem I remember watching you when I was a young kid. And <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to make me feel old, right? I remember I, watching you. I even know, the, know, know how you used to say it. So, man, it's, it's, it's a pleasure meeting you and uh, you know, thanks for, for taking the chance. And I'll steal a line from Jamie that he said in one of our first meetings that baseball is our platform. It's not our purpose. Right. And so we really uh, have that in mind. The special events out there, we got NASCAR legends. Believe it or not, we got some wrestling legends. <laughs> um, but uh, we are really going to have a night of entertainment uh, out there. It's like nothing you've ever seen. Uh, I'm obviously not the baseball guy. I'm the promotions guy. That's the baseball guy. But I have said in many a meeting that I don't think Springfield, uh, they'll get to know, but how lucky, I'm, I'm lucky to be partners with him, but he is a 
lifer in the baseball industry, so it's something that really attracted me uh, to put my brand and, and to put my time and effort into it. So I'm really looking forward to uh, Lucky Horseshoe season uh, and many to come. So thank yep. you all. All the woman Conley. Thank you. I, I just have one minor complaint for you guys. <laughs> I just looked at the schedule, and the tail wagon days are on Tuesday nights. When <gasps> you're uh, oh, <laughs> not cool. We will have to end one of these meetings early enough that yes. we can come out because I have two dogs who we'll I'm just sure hold would them love to the watch. Park. Right at, at home plate one night. That would be nice. That would be good. Oh, you, you don't want me throwing <laughs> My dogs will chase them for you if you ever need that. But no, thank you. Welcome to the to Springfield. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you for your thank time. You. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Next, we have the Inspector General report. Former Judge Mealy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. In my experience, divorces and the breakup of personal relationships bring out the worst in people. <laughs> and when a city employee or a city elected official gets divorced, it's a personal matter. It doesn't need to have the inspector general involved, but here I am. Before I give my report, I want you to consider these things Keep them in mind as I'm giving my report. Number one, the allegations in this matter took place approximately six years ago. Number two, nothing was reported to the city for three and a half years after that. Number three, Rex Range, the city employee involved, is a 32-year employee with an outstanding work history and no prior discipline other than with regard to this matter. And finally, Mr. Streck has talked to others and other agencies and other people about these allegations, and no one has taken any actions and instigated any investigations or did anything with regard to these allegations. So what happened? Recently, Mr. Strack signed up to talk to you, and I understand he talked to you last week, two <coughs> weeks ago, excuse me. And in that, he mentioned things about our city clerk, Mr. Lesko, and about employee, Mr. Range. City clerk, Frank Lesko, said, please let the inspector general look into it. Judge Holmes had a conflict, and so I was the lucky recipient of this case. I interviewed, spoke to, received texts, other matters, from Mr. Strack. I talked to Mr. Lesko. I talked to Mr. Range. I reviewed any documents anybody wanted me to review. The allegations were that he used a city computer to look up information on Mr. Strack, and then Mr. Lesko, three and a half years later, being informed of it, did not adequately discipline him. In November of 2016, Mr. Rex Range was going through a divorce. His wife, started a relationship with Mr. Michael Strack. And what seems to be the first play in every playbook of a spouse, when their other spouse starts a relationship with someone else, is they check out that person. The range decided to check out Mr. Strack and seek information. He did so on his own time with his own personal computers and de electronic devices. He was having a meeting one day with his wife after work. He found out about information about Mr. Strack in another county. While he was on his break, he used the city computer to request the information about Mr. Strack on that day. My investigation, I found that he did not use his city computer for any other personal information or anything else involving this matter. Why did he want this information? To give it to his wife, to give him information about Mr. Streck. He got the information. He didn't get it 
to steal his identity, to publish it, to discredit him or anything. He got it to give to his wife. And what did he do with it? He gave it to his wife, all of it, didn't keep it. What he did with it? What did she do with it? She gave it to Mr. Streck. So the information about Mr. Streck was given to Mr. Streck. Should be noted also that Mr. Strack has not said that any of this information that Mr. Range collected was wrong, inaccurate, misleading, false. It was all true. Everything he got was true. It was just that he was not happy that he got the information about him. This happened in November of 2016. Nothing happened. Fast forward, July 2020, he comes to the city to Mr. Lesko and says, your employee got used his position to get information about me. I want you to do something about it. Mr. Lesko investigated the matter. All he could find was the one email that Rex Range ever used a city computer on. Mr. Rex Range is denied using any computer, using his influence, anything with regard to his city employment and obtaining this information. After consulting Corporation Council and others, what he should do, Mr. Lesko made the decision that he should give him a verbal reprimand. He said, we didn't have written rules that said don't ever use your personal computer at work for personal, your, your city computer for for personal matters at work. However, he said it was an understanding. People knew you're not supposed to use your city computer at work for personal matters. And Mr. Range being no discipline whatsoever, an outstanding employee, and three and a half years had gone by, and there hadn't been any other incidents of him using his personal computer to get information about Mr. Strack. So that's what he did. Again, nothing happens, and now he signs up two more years later to talk to you. I get involved, look into the matter. I believe that he did use the computer one time. I believe that Mr. Lesko, the city clerk, handled it adequately, gave the appropriate discipline for what was done in this incident, and that this matter should be closed. I mean, there's nothing else involving the city, involving these people, that it isn't a personal matter between Mr. Streck, Strack and Mr. Range. I don't see it. I couldn't find it. I did not find any criminal activity. Mr. Strack talks about criminal activity. I should point out to you. <clears throat> there's some of the offenses he's talking about I looked at were misdemeanors, some were a felony. The most was three years statute of limitations, which means no wonder nobody has done anything because if you go to a prosecutor and say this crime took place six years ago and has a three year statute of limitations, guess what they're going to say to you? I got a stack of reports a foot high of crimes that took place last night that I can prosecute and investigate. I'm not going to look into a case that took place six years ago and even if I find something, there's nothing I can do about it. That's why, we, and why do we have statutes of limitations for civil and criminal cases? Memories fade, evidence disappears, people forget things. That's why they want to do it. Every case I've had as inspector general has been on stuff that just happened. And people's memories are still there, the evidence is there, I can take care of it, and if we need to do something, we can handle it. This took place six years ago, folks. Now, I know Mr. Strack is not happy with my investigation, saying that Nothing should be done by the city. But what Mr. Strack doesn't understand is I am not his personal investigator. I'm your inspector general. I look into the matter, the things that involve city, Springfield. I don't care what people do, what you do on your private time. It's not my job to look into that. As long as it doesn't affect the city, we don't have to have any, you know, I don't need to be involved. You don't need to be involved. I, I would have recommended a number of things for him to go to to talk about these allegations. 
but he's already did it, and they've already turned him down and said, no, we're not going to do anything about it. So the only thing I told him he could do is talk to a private counsel if he wants to seek some other actions. But again, those actions don't involve you or me as a city inspector. So I am recommending that this matter be closed. I'm closing my file. I'm not doing any more work on this case. I don't think it's that ne necessary. And I suggest that you do the same, that you've heard Mr. Strack, you heard his side of the story, you've now heard my investigation. You can do with what you like. Is there any questions from anyone on this matter? Any questions? Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Continue you. doing the good work of matters that involve the city. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. We try. Thanks, Judge. Thanks, Judge. <laughs> Next, we'll have uh, Doug Brown for a report on the energy market. So you probably have heard a lot of stuff in the news here lately um, the, uh, about basically the energy markets, um, uh, rolling blackouts, increase in prices. Uh, you know, other utilities have made some statements. Um, and I kind of wanted to uh, bring some clarity uh, to everything and kind of explain where we're at with uh, what we have uh, as well and our resources. Um, you know, besides providing water, there's no more important issue for city water, light, and power than providing, uh, you know, our residents with reliable, um, affordable electricity. Uh, we spent a lot of time over the last few years really trying to educate uh, lawmakers, regulators, um, that, uh, you know, what, what are those impacts for accelerating decarbonization? Uh, to, to a place where there's not reliable replacement uh, resources that are available. No one really thought that the electric grid would experience this so fast, but here we are. MISO's uh, central and northern regions are not the only issues, uh, uh, not the only areas with issues. Uh, California and Texas are experiencing similar problems. California actually announced that they uh, had uh, uh, produced their energy with 100% renewables. So all of their energy was produced with 100% renewables. A few days later, they said they would not be able to meet their summer peak load demand, um, predicting about a 1,700 to 5,000 megawatt shortfall. We are in a stronger position owning our own generation uh, with stable pricing. Uh, we do have, there's, uh, we're exposed to transmission supply constraints. There's a lack of accredited generation out there for uh, resources. You know, and we've got these thermal plants that are retiring across the state and in the MISO region and, and as a whole. It's troublesome because it's leading to higher prices and reliability issues. And this, this problem for the summer um, is here, but unfortunately these are gonna linger until the, the stability can be brought back to the energy markets. So some of the turmoil for, for the energy markets, there's a lot of factors and it's complicated because we have issues of natural gas costs, supply chain issues, all these, uh, these variables that are playing into causing this turmoil. Base load generation uh, retirements are, are coming on faster than expected, so that's thermal generation. Um, there's a lack of new generation. Renewables are not being installed fast enough and uh, they're also, they're not accredited like baseload thermal units. They, they're intermittent uh, resources, so they're valued less for their capacity. Market forces are also driving up solar pricing. So a, a solar PPA, which is a power purchase agreement, uh, in the last year it's increased about $20 per megawatt hour. Um, the last thing we probably wanna do is enter into a, a renewable contract like that um, at the extreme high prices, kind of what happened with the wind contracts in the end. Uh, we ended up upside down over the 10 year period and it cost our, our ratepayers uh, quite a bit of money. There's supply chain issues that are being disruptive. You know, if there's a generator that's offline somewhere, 
waiting for parts that can impact things. Uh, and I'll bring up the solar panels again that basically uh, there's a tariff issue with the United States Commerce uh, Department that's looking into supposedly China companies kind of rerouting solar panels through different foreign companies. So it's, it's kind of put a whole hold on solar installations that are, that are relying on imported solar panels. You have uh, natural gas price increases. Basically, because of the Ukraine war, they've doubled in the last year. Um, and then we have the Illinois energy policy with deregulation that started years ago. It, the, it separated uh, generation from investor-owned utilities. Um, and it decoupled traditional reliability requirements from generation ownership. Merchant generation has no reliability requirement uh, to keep baseload units running, and they sure uh, do not have financial incentives to do so. Illinois and Michigan are the only states that are not vertically integrated in MISO. All of these factors, uh, they're definitely contributing to the, the MISO warnings and the high energy market prices. Even the independent market monitor spoke Friday with the Illinois uh, Commerce Commission and said, stated that, in their opinion, plant retirements are the key issue here. So what's driving plant retirements? So there's a lot of factors here, but it, it really all relies on economics, right? They all kind of, kind of go back to that for the most part um, in a big way, and it's the economics are driving thermal plant retirements because it, inc it includes all the environmental regulations that really, you could say, go back maybe 15 years um, that require heavy capital investments by these thermal plant owners. And, and why would any thermal plant want to invest this kind of money into a, a plant that is losing money against the market? There are no requirements from the state of Illinois uh, to maintain a, a, a level of local capacity. There are no financial incentives to do so uh, to keep these plants open either. Financial institutions and insurance companies, they're basically walking away from thermal plants. So they're actually discouraging thermal plants from being built uh, versus non-dispatchable renewables. And then <clears throat> legislation basically that's been passed in the state, does that discourage basically thermal plants from being built in the future? Um, so it's all adding up. There's not one particular item, but there's just a lot of things that are confluencing at the same time. And we're going to talk a little, lot more about MISO, so I kind of want to give some background, some context with that. Um, the Mid-Continent Independent, Independent System Operator, um, so there's many of these across the United States, and basically it, is the, it manages the electrical grid as a region. And then you can see basically there's 10 zones from Louisiana up to Canada. Illinois is zone four for the most part. The area that's north of I-80 is in a different, uh, what we call ISO, Independent System Operator. Um, it's called PJM, is what it's in. MISO is a reliability coordinator and a market coordinator. They're independent functions, um, but they work together to provide a reliable electric grid. Uh, you could think of MISO as an air traffic controller, but for the electric grid. It, uh, it controls the flow of electricity basically to its, its utilities that are within its territory. And all systems uh, must be, uh, they must belong to a, reliabil a reliability coordinator. CBLP is too small to be its own reliability coordinator and, and NERC in fact wouldn't even certify us to do so. So not only does MISO not own uh, transmission or generation um, assets, they are, they, they're called policy takers, not makers. So what that means, they cannot override any um, regulation or state mandate to make sure they protect electric reliability of the grid. They do administer buying and selling of uh, energy and capacity uh, while managing constraints on the grid. A constraint um, is like a transmission or generation asset that's been impaired on the system. Um, you know, the benefit, though, of belonging to MISO and we don't really have a choice on that, except for maybe belonging to a different ISO uh, if we're connected. Um, but the benefit is when our generation is not available, if it's on outage or if it tripped offline, um, if, if it's a peak summer day, um, we can pull off the grid for that power.
the MISO capacity auction um, that we'll talk about more later, it, it's not meant for utilities uh, to meet a majority of their capacity obligations. It's more of a residual market. Uh, Illinois is a deregulated, re deregulated state, so investor-owned utilities cannot own their own generation to meet their capacity needs. So I'm going to turn it over to Scott to kind of go over some electric reliability now. So we'll cover a little bit on the reliability side. Um, again, unfortunately, we knew there was going to be some issues coming up with some of the regulations and what we've seen in the market. We didn't anticipate it this soon, but it's come to fruition quicker than we anticipated. So what is our role in an emergency situation with MISO? MISO determines and declares the and, and communicates all that to all of the companies that are in their area. Typically for us, that will be in zone four. It will include us, it includes Xamarin, it includes all the other entities that serve load in, in this zone. So that's communicated through our dispatch center. We then communicate that out to the plant, to ESO, and to our public information officer who will dis dispatch that information out to the public in different ways, and, and we will do different things. On our side, there's demand reductions um, that will, will take place at the plant level. We go through and we'll shut off a lot of vent fans. We shut off lighting. We do a lot of demand reduction on our side to help more energy go out to the system. At the same time, we make that plea to the public to try to reduce demand as much as possible. Um, we also, we can, there's interruptible customers. We, we have some customers that are on interruptible power. We can shut them off. And the last, one of the last things we can do is reduce voltage on the system. Um, it's not an ideal situation, but it's within limits that we can do. We had plenty of these in the last couple of years. We had seven or eight of them last year where the alerts came out and we notified the top 100 customers. Last week we had three of them, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday last week. Um, primarily May, 90 degree weather, hot and humid. Didn't anticipate that. Um, May also is a time for a lot of transmission outages. So there's two Ameren outages around us. There's also some units down south that are still on outage. So that was kind of a unique situation last month, but we have already had three this year. Um, and again, it's attributed to increased load, lack of generation is, is where those are coming from. So what are our resources for peak demand? So we do have Unit 4. We have factory Reynolds and Interstate still. Um, we did complete transmission upgrades that we can import power. Uh, we can still cover the majority of our load with our generation, um, except at peak times. I think the, the numbers we had was 95% of the time we can cover 99% of our load. So there's, a, there's peaks that we can't quite cover, and that's where our, our membership of MISO is, is also valuable there. The, uh, that energy, though, or that energy that we can generate does not cover us or does not keep us from being involved in these issues where there's a reliability issue on the grid. So even though we might be able to cover the majority of our load, there's still going to be times where we will be asked to shed load or take mitigation steps to reduce our energy demand to help the regional grid as a whole. It's like mutual aid. Um, you think of it, we have a pool of resources across MISO. And, and we're part of that, and it goes both ways. There's times where we're going to have excess energy we can push out and help. There's times where we're going to need that energy to pull back in to help, to help us. <clears throat> so it's, you know, we can't stop the, region or the rolling blackouts, but we can help support them. So you've seen MISO announce this summer they're projected 5 gigawatts short. I think Doug covered that a little bit earlier. Uh, of firm energy, and that firm energy is is a reliable rotating mass. So it, it's it's coal, it's nuclear, it's gas turbines. Um, that and again, that shortfall is attributed to the demand and the lack of generation from retirements of some of these thermal units. The risk in 22 is relatively low. There still is a risk that it'll happen. Next year, they're projecting 11 gigawatts of. of retirements in coal plants again next year. So this year it's one thing, next year could be a whole nother story. It could be even worse next year. 
So one of our mitigations, the last, basically one of the last steps in mitigation is a rolling blackout. So what is a rolling blackout? It's phased in over separate circuits and transmission areas, depending on who you are. For us, we have our system broke down into a lot of circuits. We know what our load is on those circuits, and we can isolate those circuits individually. Uh, in case like Ameren, they're going to shut whole substations down, and it'll be large areas, much larger than what we would have. And, and really, that's, that's that balance in supply. So you think of energy as the ultimate and just-in-time delivery. You have a large load that comes in or a large load that goes off, you have to be able to adjust to that instantaneously or the, the grid will, will get upset. If you get that out of, out of whack, that will create blackouts and, and it could create a total blackout in the end. And if some of you might remember back in 2003, I know I remember this, I was at the plant and we were worried about it. There was a blackout that started on the East Coast and came all the way across almost into, I think it did get into part of Indiana. That was a total blackout where there was no electricity available. That restoration took 48 hours. So you look at it from our side of a 15 minute interruption to one of our customers versus a 48 hours to recover from a total blackout. So again, rolling blackouts are our last resort. Um, you know, it's during emergency needs and, and we will take mitigations to try not only us, Everybody else will be taking mitigation to try to, to mitigate that and resolve that before it gets to that point. Some of the things we can do is import, well not we, some of the things MISO can do, they can import from uh, other areas, whether it be Indiana, whether it be PGM, their Southwest Power Pool, which is over in um, Western Missouri and Kansas area. They can import power from them. They can import power from different zones. Um, you know, as the 10 zones, we can import power from those also to help mitigate some of those issues on, on MISO side. Um, on our side, we can delay maintenance on transmission and generation. So if there's any critical work, we can delay that to help. Uh, and again, we talked about demand side reductions. We will put our peaking units on. Um, then, then when it gets up to a certain level of event, we will notify our top 100 customers to start conserving energy. Um, we'll make that broader appeal to our co other customers. And at that point, you know, then we get into voltage reductions. And then at the end of that, the last step is rolling blackouts. So our implementation of rolling blackouts, as I said earlier, we have, we have circuits that we have identified um, and they're grouped in, in different areas. We know the, the anticipated load, typical load of what those would be. And then we also have real-time data, so we know what those loads are. Um, and again, ours or MISO will identify that mitigation if that's what's needed. They will notify us of a load we have to shed. It's pro rata based on what's needed across either zone four or the whole grid, the whole MISO network. It'll be a pro rata on our percentage of what that would be. So in, in the case of it's, you know, our load's 350 megawatts that day and, and our share is 10%, we'll have to shed say 35 megawatts. Uh, we have circuits identified and we'll be able to go through and roll through those. Our plan is every 15 minute. Um, so we'll shut a, a circuit down for 15 minutes, go to the next circuit, close it, and re-energize the one prior to that. Um, so it's done. When MISO makes that declaration, they will tell us a start time to start that. Typically, there will not be an end time. Um, it will be ongoing so they can judge and, and kind of gauge what those mitigations are doing. Do they have to increase it? Was it too much? Can they back off? What are those mitigations going to go away? So one of the questions that has came up, can we disconnect from the grid during a black or to, to avoid blackouts? The short answer is no. Um, we are reliant upon that grid and, and there's some instances where that grid is reliant upon us. Um, if you get into peak loads and we don't have enough energy, it, would, it could create larger issues for us and for the grid itself. And to give you an idea of somebody that islands themselves, the state of Texas and ERCOT, they are an island basically. Um, in winter of 2021, you kind of seen what happens there when you have lack of available energy that you can import. They have one tie outside of their system and I think it's a 600 megawatt tie for the almost the entire state of Texas. So again, you know, besides our obligation to support the regional grid, 
it's a mutual aid aspect where they support us too at times of need. Uh, one of the other questions in, is could the older Doman units avert rolling blackouts? And, and the answer, again, the answer is no. Uh, the, this is a short, easy, quick answer. You're talking gigawatts of energy short in the area. And if, even if 33 was available and it's about 185 megawatts, that's not going to do anything across the whole region, across the grid to, to save any of that. Um, can 33 be put back in service to help with some of the, the higher cost? And, and again, the answer is no. There's many factors that go into that. A lot of them is the regulations. Um, ELG, the effluent limit guidelines, CCR, coal combustion residuals, are ash ponds. And, and currently, the US EPA um, denying or uh, basically putting on notice they're going to potentially deny our petition to still send some uh, stuff to the ash pond. But given it's 135 days, once they make their final decision, that basically <coughs> effectively with $50 million for environmental costs, $3 million to repair it, um, the supply chain issues, if we can still get the material today, uh, lack of staff, we've already laid off the staff. No insurance, you know, it just goes on and on. It would not be effective for us to put 33 back on. So the last thing, what can we do to improve reliability? For us as a, as a small potato in the whole market, there's a little bit we can do. Um, currently, we do have Black Star capability. And when I talk about Black Star capability, what we're talking about is the ability to island ourselves and, and bring our system back up with no imported power. Um, we are one of the few utility, I think we are the only utility in Illinois that can still do this. The other one that we know of for sure is the down lake of the Ozarks, Ameren, Missouri, off of the Osage Dam. Um, so what, what we can do though, we currently can run interstate, be able to black start interstate, that is with two small factory and rental units that are 1970 vintage. One of the things we're looking at is being able to put a dual fuel, potentially a dual fuel gas oil fired unit out by interstate that would be more reliable to start interstate. Um, with, this, with that in interstate running, we could start unit four. The other option is put something out at unit four. Uh, part of the problem with that is that's gonna be a much larger unit uh, than, than just starting interstate. The amount of gas available at the plant, we're not sure that that off of Ameren's residential, basically, or commercial uh, loop that they have, we would have enough energy or gas available to start roughly 50 megawatts of, of gas fire generation in addition to firing Unit 4 with gas and getting it on. So there, that's a little bit deeper study that we will look at if we need to, but we're going to start with uh, looking at black starting interstate and putting combustion turbine or gas fire turbine out there. With that, I'll turn it back to Doug to finish. So now we're going to talk uh, about the, I guess you say the issues in the, in the basically the pricing impacts for capacity and energy. And there's two components when we talk about buying energy off the grid. There's capacity and energy. Capacity is like a, a reservation uh, ahead of time for the right to be able to use that energy in the future. And then there's the actual energy that's needed. So the capacity auction results, um, again, the auction is uh, it's basically a procurement process. It's a residual market, so it's not meant to be the sole uh, source for any uh, utility's uh, capacity. And uh, you get, as you can see, the, our statement here is it's, been, it's increased 50 times basically from last year to this year because of an of a extremely large shortfall uh, to be able to cover peaks. So you have less capacity, less generation available that was bid in the auction. Um, you have basically the, the, what's left is, is lower accredited or less firm capacity that's left. And uh, renewable, en renewable energy, um, you know, it's not fully accredited. So it's intermittent. Again, it's that, that means only when the sun shines and the wind blows. The load forecast also increased more than expected. So with scarce capacity, uh, prices jumped. Here's the results for the capacity market. 
And the north, central and northern zones cleared at 236 megawatts per day. Uh, last year, they were $5 per megawatt day. That is a huge increase in price. And, you know, and really, the, the, the problem is from MISO's process with the auction, um, and how, you know, and how it values every resource. It's also a lack of state requirements for capacity. So here's just a trend. You can see that um, it's just uh, basically our solid fuels are kind of decreasing. Natural gas and renewables are, are, are increasing. And renewables, you, you would say, is slightly increasing, really, and for the most part, compared to what gas is going up. So what is the need and kind of what's the, some of the costs when we're discussing uh, what we need for energy? Again, Dalman 4 is acting as a shield uh, with some stable pricing for us, and it does cover most of our needs except for during peak demand. And the, but that additional need that we require is exposed to the market. And uh, with that, that, you know, we're not the only utility that does that. When most utilities are buying from the market for uh, for energy when to meet they need to meet their peak. But when you're looking at capacity, it's more firm. It's it's based upon um, basically a planning year. And it's fixed at that point. So we 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 will we will know here very shortly uh, what our costs for capacity uh, fully are. But it, we look at capacity to meet our obligation with our own generation, bilateral purchases, and then the yearly auction. Energy's almost the same. Uh, we use our generation, bilateral purchases, day ahead purchases, and real time purchases basically cover our load. To kind of give you a, uh, a little bit of a value of what our generation is worth, if, if the value in the auction of what those prices were that I had showed on the last slide is worth $23 million if we had to buy it instead on the market. Our hedges that we made um, with bilateral purchases of basically $1.4 million this year would have cost an additional $10.3 million. So our impact to our customers, again, you know, the analysis is still underway on some of this because uh, uh, capacity numbers aren't finalized by MISO. But with Unit 4 acting as a shield, we're definitely in a better position. But uh, the Citizens Utility Board, CUB, it's predicting basically double prices for, for most others in the state. Um, capacity, you know, for Ameren, they made some announcements, some predictions. And coming from a lot of different sources, it looks like there's anywhere from $40 to hundreds of dollars more per month. Um, that's going to be increased on their average customer bill. Uh, you know, Ameren doesn't own their own generation, at least Ameren, Illinois, doesn't own their own generation. So they're more exposed than what we are. We cannot uh, finalize our numbers until MISO is done. Um, but we are expecting additional costs to our average customer's residen residential bill. And it's going to probably be around a few dollars a month uh, increase for this planning year. And that's planning years, June 1 through May 31st every year. Um, the fuel adjustment is what takes care of our energy and capacity purchases uh, when it relates to our customer's bill. Um, and there, that usually falls a, a couple months behind uh, once we fi finalize those numbers. <clears throat> so, you know, basically, if you're a utility that doesn't have your own generation, you're more exposed to the market and you have to buy your capacity and energy in a more volatile situation. The fuel adjustment that we have on, a, on our, you know, our customer's bill basically accounts for costs or savings to our customers. Now, uh, last year, uh, for many months, we actually had credits on the bills because we were able to procure power lower than what our costs were. So that returns back to the customers. This year is going to be opposite of that. Our bills will have to increase to uh, make up for those differences. And, you know, this is something that's just kind of interesting that we've, we got some data um, from another uh, resource, I guess you might say, that, that showed some state averages and uh, for a residential customer. So we looked back at the, the last few years and, and, and kind of entered ours in, and we're basically showing that we're, we're lower than uh, a lot of the, basically the state average across many months for the, the last few years. So 
So, you know, you know, as this issue unfolds, we want to make sure we kind of help everybody understand what's going on, um, kind of be out in front of it as much as we can. We want to be able to promote conservation more. Um, I think that's going to be important. We want to show uh, how they can conserve and really be prepared for like any worst case scenario for rolling blackouts if that really occurred. Um, but they are a last resort. I want to make sure that's clear for everybody that that's the last resort that, that would take place and that the risk for 2022, um, you know, MISO had met with the ICC Friday and, and, and that's where the statement comes from is that they clarified that that 2022 this year is, is less likely. It's not as much of a concern because there's, there's a shortage of capacity in the market because those units, those thermal units pulled out of the market, but they're still running. Next year, they will shut down though. They won't be operating if they keep their promise. Um, so next year could be a lot more scarier when it comes to rolling blackouts in 2023. But we're gonna do our best to shield our customers from these higher costs with our, with our units. Um, and I know this is kind of a complex issue. We've covered a lot of stuff um, and what's going on with the energy, energy industry right now. Um, so, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have questions. Alderman Donnelly. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Uh, Director, when, uh, when either myself or my staff is giving a presentation, before we do it, we always ask each other, you know, what's the purpose of the presentation? In other words, what do you hope to accomplish with the presentation? And uh, I just want to be very clear here. What was the purpose for coming here tonight? What was your purpose for this, with this presentation? The, the, I mean, the purpose is for really more for educational purposes. Um, we want to educate the issues that we're seeing in the energy market. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are flying around, I think, with, you know, what's causing it. Um, so I wanted to kind of lay that out with all the different variables and make sure it's clear that there's just a lot of different, very, very varying factors that are contributing. It's not just one thing. Yeah. Um, also, the, the fact that, um, you know, the energy prices are increasing dramatically, but our, our generation is helping protect us. Right. And I want but, to make sure that's. But, but I don't, I don't, and I don't mean to cut well. you off, but oh sure, let's just cut to the chase. Yeah. What did you hope to accomplish with this presentation? Just short, sweet. What did you hope to accomplish? Well, it's 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 basically again, it's just educating the the you and the public for what we have. What's the value of the utility? Right. I, I get that, but what I heard is that the, clearly the purpose is one inform the council that we could have blackouts. Two, that costs are gonna go up, that simple. I appreciate the comment about four. We didn't have four, we'd be, I hesitate to say the word, but we'd be in a lot of trouble, I'll just say it that way. Right. And that's a fact. Um, what, I, what I'm troubled with is, I get the, I get the, price, the price part. You know, there's a lot of things you can't control. We've had a lot of changes in the last, mm -hmm. last few months. Um, but on the capacity side, uh, when we were talking about units three in particular, Unit three in particular, closing that unit. And uh, I don't ever remember the conversation about us not being able to meet our peak. I don't remember that specifically being a part of that conversation. I know we were focused more on the cost of running the unit, the problems we'd have with getting it back up, uh, the, the uh, regulatory issues. But I don't ever remember. And I don't, I don't, even, listen, I don't even expect you to reply to that part. Okay. But it's troubling because what I, how, I, how I perceive the first part of this presentation is, we're covering our butt. You're telling us that we could have blackouts, but you said something in that was key. You said, we're trying to stay in front of it. What's the plan? We're trying to stay in front of it. What's the plan? Well, as far as rolling blackouts, or are you talking about the capacity? They're the same. So, well, sort of. Um, I mean, the rolling blackouts are a regional issue, okay? Um, you know, when it comes to capacity costs, that's more of a But I want to hear issue. what the plan is. What are we going so, to do to address those issues? Now we all know, everybody in the room, we all know. Okay, great. I want to hear what the plan is. Because I got a call, uh, I get a lot of calls. I got a call about a week ago from an employee. You know, you know hey, Jim, you should, you should be concerned about basically this very issue. And uh, this is somebody that, just, just a regular guy. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so I was waiting. I'm glad you came. I do appreciate that. But what's frustrating to me is I don't hear a plan. We've got to have a plan because what's going, to, what's going to happen if we can't meet demand? Who's going to get the phone calls? 
All right. So again, um, during the IRP, uh, and where are, and where we, are we? Uh, where are we with this power trip purchase agreements that we talked about a long time ago? Right. Where are we? Why? Are, why don't we? Do we have those in place? We haven't had an update on those in months. So that's one of the th my key points that was in there. Looking at solar, and we were looking at solar uh, farm. Yeah, but where are we with the where are we with the agreements? What? Where are we? That's specifically. Right. So every time that we would go back to them and ask for a pricing update, they would increase their price, and again they would increase their price. Um, those are issues that are kind of outside our control. Again, you know, overpaying for power. I can bring a, a, an agreement at fifty dollars per megawatt hour. That's going to be a lot of money if we lock in that for 20 years, and then in five years, the prices drop. Why couldn't I just say, well, if we would have entered into an agreement five months ago, it would have been cheaper today than today. That, that's a fact. Well, and what I've been told. Doug, uh, I, don't, I, don't mean to be, I don't mean to be extremely obtuse here, but it's frustrating when uh, I appreciate you informing us of the problems, but we've got to have a plan. And we've got to, we've got to make sure everybody knows about it. And uh, the pricing... Obviously, there's issues we can't control there. We have mechanisms in place. Uh, some, some of them, obviously, they impact our rate payers significantly. But on the, the reliability side, we've, we've, we've said time and time again how proud we are of this utility and being able to be, I know we're not 100% on our own because we, we're involved with MISO, and there's absolute advantages, as we proved last week when the, the unit tripped and we were down. But what are we going to do? So, again, you know, the, the IRP, we, we did share that information. We discussed that with the slides and stuff that showed just exactly what Scott said earlier. Was it 95% of the time we could cover 99% of, of, our, of our load? That was a fact. We stated that. That was clear. So don't make a mistake on thinking that we didn't discuss that issue. Um, that was very forward with that. Uh, and we're considering on getting rid of generation like that. It did put us in a spot where we had to rely on the grid, period. Yes, and you said that. I remember um, that part. But capacity-wise, again, for this year, we secured capacity. We, we uh, used our units. We hedged and bought capacity ahead of time. We had some in the, in the energy markets for the auction. It was not expected by anybody to go up like it did. Just wasn't. In fact, I mean, nobody recommended that we purchase uh, all 100% ahead of time. So next year, we will try to procure that, but we will probably be paying a premium to procure ahead of time against the, the auction. Um, we the don't fact have, is, we don't to the choice, auction, do we? Could, I mean, that's kind of what, that's really what we have to do. That's true, yes. Um, that's and, we're, and we're limited on what generation we can build. So with solar being so expensive now, because of various issues that are outside of our control, um, we can build smaller gas turbines. We can't build larger ones that are more economical because of the state rules. So we're kind of stuck with I guess what, I with our keep options. Interrupting you, but I guess what I'd like to see is let's, <laughs> let's put forward a, a true plan that we can address some of these issues because you're telling us it's not gonna, going to get any better. Well, we, we didn't come with a plan. We have done some steps to mitigate that already. We, part of the agreement we have for capacity is a five-year agreement, so we have some of that locked in already. Um, in addition to that, we have already procured some energy for next year to cover those peaks for the entire year, the entire physical year of 23. So we have done some of those on our, just because we knew it was coming once we started seeing these. We started planning ahead already, and I've already got that locked in. Well, I... So that covers, so what we're getting to is with Unit 4, Interstate. So Interstate and the combustion terminals are a natural hedge to us. So Interstate's gas-fired. So as prices get over $100, it's got to be $10 gas for Interstate to be uneconomical. So even though we don't cover everything, we've got what we did for next year is bought small block for the entire year to cover that. Then Interstate's the next hedge. If, if prices are under $100 or under roughly $80 right now at $8 gas, Interstate is our hedge to cover that other additional. Well, what, what I'd like to see is, you know, we're, we're your board of directors, is we'd like to be able to answer the simple question to our constituents. Hey, I heard there was this presentation the other night at, at the council about rolling blackouts. What are you going to do to avoid it? Got to have a solid answer. So as, as we said in that presentation, Rolling blackouts, even if we could cover 100% of our load, we would not be able to avoid them. Right. 
I, 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 I misspoke. But what I'm saying okay. is, how do we avoid power being shut down here in Springfield? And you answered, you answered one of my questions with the slide. We can't just cut ourselves off. Right. So, or, but, yeah. I mean, think, think about it. You're a resident, and you ask, you ask that question, how are you going to avoid, are we going to have blackouts? I, the answer can't be, well, we really can't control that. We're part of MISO. Yeah. If MISO tells us we have to shed load, we will shed load. We can't avoid that. Yeah, if I will, um, let's do a little history lesson right here, and I've asked them to put it in the slide. CWLP of yesteryear is gone. Right. What happened was we used to sell direct to all our residents and all the businesses. This is prior to MISO. Then the power marketing situation happened, the power marketing debacle. Now we rely on the grid. So we have to sell everything out to the grid and we buy it back. So we don't get the dollar for dollar that we used to. We get 90 some cents or whatever it is. But the issue is now we generate and sell it all to the market and we have to buy it back. And that puts us at the, uh, you know, the control of MISO and the grid. Isn't that correct? I mean, more or less, you know, it's, it's uh, we pay fees to MISO, you know, that we've shown in budget presentations. Um, but, uh, the, you know, the dollar for dollar, I guess you might say, it's it's pretty much equal. You know, whatever our load is, basically our, you know, our is what we're, you know, able to buy from the market and sell into the market. It's the same thing. They kind of cancel each other. But the fees whittle at the, the, the dollar value for that. Um, but CWLP, we used to sell direct to our residents, the businesses, and then when we become reliant on the grid, that's the, that's what we're under. That's what everybody's under, and that's Correct. why we can't control the blackout situation. And you have to be. You They're know, controlling the power um, distribution. Just in the presentation, it was discussed about the reliability coordinator that we have to belong to it. We're required that by FERC. We don't have a choice. Um, and again, we're not this. We're, we're so small. We don't have the resource to do that. And NERC, which is an arm of, of FERC, um, they wouldn't certify us in any way. Um, so we don't have a choice. We can belong to MISO. We can belong to PJM. We still have the same kinds of issues. Well, plus it, it is a backup when we do have problems like we correct, did. correct, correct. yes. I'm done. And unfortunately, you know, we can't build enough generation either to make up for the differences that's what they're predicting. Alderman Repath. A lot of my questions are answered, but Director, I remember our year-long discussions we had when we were trying to decommission the three units that one of the, one of the questions I asked you is, Dalman 4 have enough generation to cover our native load? And you told me it was. And now it's not? Is that what you're saying? I, I'm... I don't remember saying it was, it was to be able to cover our peak. Um, it's never been designed to do that. It, would, it takes our, our, our unit four plus our gas turbines can cover most of the load most of the time, except for at peak. And, and uh, our, our 50, Interstate 55 area for the, for the gas turbines there, they're not big enough to increase our, to, to, to cover those peaks? Well, uh, you're saying that add another unit, mean? Um, well, unfortunately, I mean, we could um, expend that money, but by 2045, it'd have to shut down. We're shutting down our, our natural gas part? Yeah, anything over 25 megawatts, we're required to shut down in 2045. Well, you know, the political atmosphere is about to change. I understand that. Things are going to get better. And, and we're not going to get through this until, oh. until we have help from Congress. And that's... Well, and, I mean, we're not left alone. I mean, we can look at 25 megawatt units and, or, or somewhat, some that are even smaller and that's what, what the one slide was kind of looking at was it's not just adding generation to Springfield, but um, how can we use that generation more wisely and black starting the units more locally instead of relying on factory rentals and having to transmit that, that power to those, those other stations. So it's, it's increasing reliability, but it's also adding capacity by doing that. Um, so I think there's value in that, um, but again, we'll have to do some studies on that to, to see where it goes. And is it NERC that uh, says that we can't uh, start one and two back up? Well, there's the US EPA rules, but also those units have been officially retired in MISO, so they'd have to go through the full MISO Q process. So, so no, I, I understand yeah. three is three's, uh, too expensive to start back up because of the damages that, that occurred in it, and plus 
but one and two is definitely out also. Correct. You, you have the same environmental regulations with the ash at the ash ponds on one and two. Converting the whole units to dry ash is, is one of the major expenses, well, I'm, plus I'm really, uh, the scrubber wastewater. Really happy to hear that solar and winds coming, man. Isn't that a great thing? Alderman McConley. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, and again, don't go first. Alderman Donovan asked a couple of the questions I had. I do have some kind of follow-ups because, sorry, I can't read my own writing. Um, first of all, so you said we, we have we can, 90, 95% of the time we can cover 99% of our load. So we are, we're just talking about that peak period. Right. And, and obviously I've seen, I mean, the, the weather forecast for the summer is, is hot. And, and that's, the, that's an expectation that's going to create increases in peaks. Um, and, and I do appreciate the follow-up that we've already procured some additional capacity. Can you give a little more information around what that means, some additional capacity? So uh, when, we, when we say we procure additional capacity, uh, we had a contract. I can't remember exactly when. It was, was it last year? Um, I think it was last year. It was with Constellation Energy, basically. Uh, we had a five-year deal with them that procured, you know, a certain amount of megawatts of capacity per year. Is that four peak periods? That is, well, capacity um, is measured off of what your, your total peak requirement is. Right. It's, it's like your peak load plus a margin. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have to have procured, in essence, for the planning year. If you don't have all of it procured, you, then whatever's left, if, just to say if there's five megawatts mm -hmm. left, you would procure that in the auction. Okay. So, and then... And, and you pointed something out because you're using words that are extraordinarily scary to people. Um, I do remember that East Coast blackout. That was horrifying. Um, what you're talking about for Springfield, I, I would like to know, do we have a commitment that what you're talking about here are 15-minute in intervals? That is in our emergency plan. That is okay. our plan is 15 minutes. So I say 15 minutes by the time we get to switching done, it might be 17, 18, 20 minutes. But it's, the plan is 15 minutes. And does that cover the entire city? It's that, rolling. that rolls by yes. intervals throughout the entire cool. city. In what order? It depends. Based, Go ahead. It depends on what load they're asking for for reduction. Because. So if the dispatcher has to look at it and say, okay, this circuit has 20 megawatts or this circuit has 5 megawatts, then he starts looking at how he can cut power to meet those obligations. So is your expectation, though, that we really should not be concerned about much? I mean, other than, you know, outages that happen because a power line's knocked down by a storm. But these rolling blackouts, we're looking at no more than maybe 20 minutes. Is that what you're committing to? Sure. That's your plan? That is the plan. Okay. Now, uh, I mean, remember, too, is, I mean, conservation is going to be a key word, too, this summer as well. Thank you for following on my next, anticipating um, my next question. And I think that we're going to, you know, we are short, in our, in our energy services offices are kind of what heads that up for us, and we are without um, a manager there still. We can't find one. There's not one that's applied. Um, we do have one individual that maybe we might uh, consider uh, asking for some forgiveness on because they live outside the city, um, but it's the employee that maybe wants to come back. Um, we'll see how that works out. Um, and uh, But, I mean, we do want to focus on conservation, though. And I, and I appreciate you anticipating my next question. That was very thoughtful of you. Um, because I was wondering if that position had been filled yet and, and what steps you're taking for that. Uh, it certainly would be important. We keep reposting and posting it higher. I, I share it as often as I can. Um, so in terms of these rolling blackouts, and again, I'm trying to maybe in some ways get some, a better understanding about this so it's not such a terrifying term. Um, what do people who have disabilities, who have a reliance on energy, consistent supply of energy to their homes, what are the steps that they need to take to inform you so that their house is not, is not interrupted? You know, they, they have to go through, the, I guess you say, the process of looking at a, um, I can't remember the right term, I don't want to use the wrong one. Do um, you remember, Amber, by chance? Um, basically, it's more of like, a critical care type of situation that, right. that that they have to be along to. I mean, it's not, if it's just disabled, they might not be qualified for that, but if there's certain qualifications that they meet going through our commercial office, um, they can qualify to get put on that list. So they contact the commercial office yes. and get information about this. Is this information you can share on your website, on the... Yes. 
Vital, vital health care. Vital health care. Okay. I mean, because that's important. Not everyone knows yes. that it's that's something that they can they can access. That they need to make sure that you know what their individual needs are. Okay. Thank you. And then, um, in terms of voluntary conservation, um, what are some examples of that? I mean, I, are you talking about like, hey, run your dishwasher and your laundry during the evening, during the nighttime when the, our demand is lower? That's, that's, I mean, anything that you can cut electrical use in the, in the peak hours, you know, maybe it's two to seven or three to seven. Um, you know, those hours are the when the peak usage uh, uh, is, is occurring. So anything that you can cut down on, on usage is going to help, you know, not, not drying your clothes, not, um, you know, turning down your AC is, if you can, you know, that, that, that helps. Uh, anything that, that people can do uh, is going to be very useful, I think, this summer. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I know that you have a very strong communication staff. Um, so I, I would appreciate if we could have some very plain, this was, this was good. I, I appreciate getting this. This, this, was, this was important for us to hear. Um, but we need some very plain language this is what you can expect. These are things that you can do to control your own situation. And, 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 you know, these are what we anticipate. This is what we, with our experience, know are our peak hours. This is what you can do to schedule things around this. So, so that we can get this information out to the community. And it's not just, hey, heads up, you can have a rolling blackout. Um, you know, head for the hills. But, I mean, one, one of the things we thought of, too, uh, is one of Amber's ideas is that um, we can have somebody from ESO or energy services office um, do like maybe a video so that way they can watch it because in trying to you know, reach out to every everybody it's gonna be a little harder and and maybe we can use you know social media to get it out there that people yep. can watch uh, how they can you know what they can do to conserve different social ideas media, and I know um, like in my house we're on the um, we, do, we do paperless billing but with those inserts instead of I remember getting them you know it was a huge pile of paper in there maybe sometimes just make Maybe just have one piece of paper that's very, you know, scary looking that just says, these are important things you need to know. I mean, this, if people have more information that they can relate to and understand um, that's simple and straightforward and, you know, an expectation, not everyone knows, hey, three to seven are our peak hours for energy demand. That's important to know. Um, so if we can just have that so that we can share mm -hmm. and, um, and make sure that people are more informed and more aware of what to expect and how they can have a part to play in this too, I'd appreciate that very much. Not a problem. Thank you. And I, yeah, again, you anticipated some questions and Alderman Donald, Donald anticipated the other ones, so thank you. Alderman Hanauer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I, I guess the first thing we better make sure is that when we flip the switch, that when we flip it back on, it, it's going to turn people back on. So I don't know what kind of maintenance or whatever, but they we better make sure that that happens, number one. Um, I'm a little frustrated because um, when we did the RFP or I, I, IRP or whatever we it was on the energy, I know we spent... I, an awful lot of money. I don't even know. I don't have the number in front of me, but it was well, $100,000 or something like that to have T tell us what to do. And then did they not fulfill their contract and tell us what to do? And if they did, then why didn't we act on it then? Because then we would have, you know, power that, that people bid on that they would have to provide us when we, when we needed it. Um, you know, I realize, and we had had a mixture of solar and and all that, but the bottom line, and and I recommended at the time that we had a had a, um, a clause that if they couldn't fulfill, they had to pay, much like we had to do way way back on the Alliant contract, we, we had to pay for what they cost. It cost that uh, whatever city to to provide the energy. Um, I mean, and then the other part to that is if T didn't fulfill their obligations, then we should get our money back from them because we spend a lot of money with that, with that one company. T gets, I know, four, four six million dollars a year from, from the utility. And um, those are fee pass throughs for the, that, that, that amount. Right. It's okay. about, I think it's about 65,000 a month. Well, uh, my my biggest my biggest concern on this is that we we did hire them, 
to analyze our bid. And my biggest question is, did they provide us with the information and why didn't we act on it? Or if they didn't, I want our dang money back. I would say that we, you know, they, they gave us the data and it did take an inordinate amount of time to, to, to sort through all the bids at the time. Um, it was identified that solar was the best option. Um, and then it was a matter of uh, going through and picking out the lowest bidders for the solar at that time because it was the best fit. I think I, I think we gave a presentation. Except at night. Something, but, um, well, again, you but know, we work at night. I agree with that, um, but it's a balance of the other things that we had. Again, we can't build more generation unless we're building the smaller units, and that's expensive. I Very. I, I mean, just, the cost to run those things are inordinate. It's just frustrating that we went through all that, we spent money, and it appears that we didn't we didn't execute the contract. And and now we're we're going. But there's and there's reasons, right? I mean, uh, and they and you, why why do these things keep happening? I, I don't know, but. The, one of the firms that we that had the lowest bid, um, we found out was building with no prevailing wage. That's not acceptable. And then we had to go back and negotiate that part. Then something else happened and they increased their price again. And then we'd go to the, the, the next bidder. Oh, they increased their price. We'd go back to the next one. Oh, they increased their price. And that is a, basically what happened for the last year and a half. Um, it, it's just, it's a really amazing what happened. And it, I would say some of it's a, a, really an extent from COVID as well. With supply chain issues, um, uh, the energy market's increasing. Uh, once they saw the energy market's increasing, everybody just rose their, raised their price ups and blamed it on, you know, su supply constraints and stuff like that. Part of it's true, yes, but part of it was also they just feel that they can extract more value. Part of that too, so... When we started going through those bids, we started talking to these companies. <coughs> Currently, none of the none of the none of the companies we talked to for solar have even built it yet, and, and that's the problem. Is even if we were in a PPA today, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be deliverable until probably 24 at this point because of all these constraints and everything that's delayed on these projects. Not only COVID. Right now. So the, the one that's closest to us that they're looking at building, they're going to move forward with it. They're still in the in the cycle for MISO to review and haven't even got through the first stage yet. So even if we did have a PPA today, or if we did get into an agreement with a PPA, we still would be probably 2023, 2024 before we were able to, to get that energy from them. Uh, there's, you know, the other thing, too, is that what we've heard from different companies, whether it be NextEra, the Energy Authority, um, the ones that are kind of in the know, the, the contracts that were entered into in the last two years, a lot of the companies are breaking them because they can't afford what they agreed to. So basically, if you entered into a contract, if we would have entered a contract a year ago, we'd be in court right now fighting it and wasting our money on court fees, and we wouldn't get the solar farm, or we wouldn't have got it. Um, so that that... It's, it's the nature of what's happened in the industry for that. Um, and our other options are just not there. We're not buying another wind farm. That's not what we need. We don't need wind power at night. Um, solar fits what we have available, matching up with our coal and our gas plants. Because um, you can ramp up your gas plants at the end to cover that, that solar cliff, as they call it, when the sun goes down to help out with that. Um, if there was another, if we could build coal-fired units or if we could build larger gas turbines, we would be looking at that. That would be another option. And we wouldn't have been kind of in this situation to some extent with energy and capacity being exposed to the market. Um, again, it's not, it's, it's only at the peaks that we're talking about or if we lose a unit. Alder Woman Purchase. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Thank you, Doug, for the presentation. And I've already had three businesses just reach out to me, like people are watching this. And I know that Alderwoman Conley has said, could we do an insert into our bills? Because I have five high rises. Not everybody has social media, and I share everything Ms. Amber puts up. And so could you really consider that and consider doing it ASAP to put inside? Do we have uh, 
the, the, I guess, was it June? Miss Amber. This May already, so. The Love at Amp series has got June, so I mean. Yeah, like maybe yeah. Tony could do a PSA because I know a lot of people watch Channel 18. Oh, to see again, it. the like they said, the, the 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 video that we would have our, our person do that would mm -hmm. explain a lot of uh, conservation tips and stuff like that. We could throw that on Channel 18. Okay, and oh, then yeah, my sec my second thing is. Um, I did understand half of what you said, but not all of it. And you talked about the emergency plan. Is there just like a Q&A fact sheet that you can give us for when our residents are kind of blowing us up? Or do you want us to send them to a, a certain number? Because I'm sure we're going to get some calls over the next few days just from watching this tonight. I, I think we can have some some of the steps yeah, summarized. We, develop it. We, we can yeah. develop something to summarize yeah. it. Yeah. This, uh, discussion, I think that would be better. Today's, but, tonight's discussion helps because we'll mm -hmm. listen to the things and break it down to layman's terms. Right. And, when, and then my last question is, when will you have like a plan back to us? I know Alderman Donnellan was asking you about it, and I know you said you've already put something in place for it over the next year. But, um, again, I don't understand everything. So when will you have a plan to bring back to us? So, you know, for the, like, sort of the capacity piece, um, so basically what we're doing there is we're procuring capacity ahead of time and then we're, we're doing it in different uh, hedges. So we have our units that provide capacity. We bought a five-year contract for capacity. We bought um, also a year worth of capacity and, and another contract. So we're hedging those things over time. Um, and we are still looking at if, if there's any chance we can do a solar deal of some sort Absolutely, but remember, too, solar is valued less than thermal generation. So, if we built, let's just say, you know, 100 megawatts today, it's valued at 50 megawatts. So, capacity. Doug, it sounds like some of this stuff is contingent. Yes. And so, is there a way that you just can keep us in the loop as you're going along and things are coming in? Oh well, yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All the women descends up. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Doug, there's no way you could have predicted that the market that anyone could have predicted with the last two years had, would bring us. No. It's an impossibility. So um, we're all dealing with it on, in one way or another. Um, climate change is real. Everyone's been saying this for years, and we haven't listened, and we haven't kept up as, as a society. Um, so this is what we're dealing with now. We are dealing with hotter summers, colder winters, um, more wind, more extreme storms. These are facts. This is science. Um, so I thank you for this presentation. Uh, this, is, this is not a surprise to me. This is what I expected to hear. Uh, you know, we had a whole Emberclear natural gas plant that was planned out in Pawnee that we voted on five years ago. Just re refreshing everyone's memory. Um, so let's just, you know, no one could predict when we had the IRP, when we were voting on these things, no one could have predicted what was going to be coming our way because of COVID, because of supply chain issues. So um, I hope everyone just takes to heart what we have going on as a world, as a society, and that we deal with this in the best way we can. Alderman McMinimum. Yeah, this is... Um Thanks for the presentation tonight, because it is on the minds of folks. Wall Street Journal had a page one story regarding, you know, what uh, Texas went through and uh, the extended blackouts in Texas. And we don't want the political climate that's in Texas. So I, I, no, appreciate, we don't. I appreciate what MISO <laughs> is trying to do, because we're trying to avoid the problems oh, that no. Texas had. And I think uh, we do have a plan. It's to avoid the extended blackouts. And uh, Springfield is not an island. Um, if we were an island, we could do something about it, but we have mutual aid agreements, which are all for the betterment of everybody, and uh, because we want to help each other. It's a cooperative environment. If, if somebody needs some of our energy, you know, we share it, and, and if we have a number four goes down for whatever reason, we can import energy, so that's all positive. And I think in the some of the... Um, discussion tonight, we've lost fact, we've lost uh, sight of some of the really positive news that you gave to us tonight, which is that our rates, our typical household electric bill 
is less than, every, than just about anywhere around the state currently. And it's generally less than the average household, I should say it better, it's, it's, it's less than the average household Illinois electric bill. And it's, and it's been that way for a few years. Our last electric rate increase was seven years ago. So we've had no rate increases on the electric side for seven years. That's very positive news. Um, if we have some increases going forward, it's because of the fuel adjustment clause. That's one of the rare occasions where, hopefully the rare occasions when we have to buy energy off the market, it's going to be higher priced than uh, we'd like it to be. Yes. I think you're doing a, you know, as best as you can under the circumstances, which are continually changing. And um, thanks for, you know, as far as what's our plan for these rolling uh, blackouts that might last for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Everyone should have a flashlight um, at night, whatever. Joe, please. No, no. <laughs> people want to dumb this down, so let's dumb it down. What, I mean, you know, we have what, to be what prepared. About the, what about the senior today. citizens who can't have exactly. air conditioning, uh -huh, okay? Right. Think about that. Well, I know. I, I, I visit, a, visit a nursing home once a week, okay. and they got an electric generator. You should generators. be in one. Did you just say I should be in a nursing home? Yeah. Let, well, uh, let Alderman make minimum. That's finish, an please. interesting comment. Um, but no, I just visit once a week. Uh, I hope to stay out. Um, I can show you some good ones I know about, though, Chuck. Um, I think you did a good job presenting tonight. Um, it's a difficult issue. Um, the um, problems are outside of our, some, many of the problems are outside of our control. We have an a imbalance right now between plant shutdowns across the nation and new generation being created. The good news out there also is that the, there's a, a revolution in lithium battery technology. You know, you got a little lithium battery in here that lasts all day long. There's efforts out there to create uh, lithium battery uh, storage from all that air and uh, the, uh, the wind power and the uh, solar power so it can be stored. We've, we haven't been able to store it. Uh, as effectively as we'd like to. So let's just balance the, the discussion with this hope down the road. So thanks for your presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I'll entertain a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the May 3rd, 2022 regular city council meeting and approve the minutes. So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. Move and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair, I'll entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council first ring of ordinances in the record of this city council. So moved. Meeting. Second. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Oh, say nay. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Chair, I'll entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council reading of the consent agenda into the record of this city moved. council meeting. Second. second. Yeah. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Oh, say nay. Motion carries. Chair, I'll entertain a Motion to place the consent agenda on final passage. Hello, Mayor. Second. second. The move and second. Any discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Alderman McMinimum. I think there's a good ordinance we've got on consent, <coughs> which I think um, will receive really unanimous support. But I, I'd just like to know, Scott, sorry we didn't have a chance to talk about this ahead of time, but, you know, um, SJR Steve um, had a, Spiri had a good full-page story about the yellow uh, giant slide at the, out at the state fair. We want to put it to use during the summertime. So my question is, Doug Knight is going to purchase it, but we're going to basically kind of subsidize some of the operations out there. And so um, is there a way to get some kind of clause in the contract so that um, he, uh, you know, agrees to keep it out there for a very long period of time since it kind of helps define our state fair in many respects, uh, is there, has that been considered in the contract so that, you know, he can't, if he owns it and, and after this subsidy runs out, I think it's three or five years or something, could he try to sell it and, and then we'd lose it? My understanding is that uh, Doug is going to sign a lease with the fairgrounds, the Illinois Department of Agriculture, to keep it at the fairgrounds. A long-term lease? Um, my understanding is yes, a multi-year lease. Well, I just recommend, Mr. Mayor, you don't have 10 to- years. You don't have to sign a contract just because we passed this ordinance, but um, please think about what contract modifications are neededly, needed to preserve our long-term interest in this slide. 
And, and, and really, our, our investment in the sponsorship is for the operations of the side to keep it open seasonally. That's really where we're going to see the most bang for our buck. Absolutely. Thanks for your efforts yep. on, on the slide. Absolutely. Yep. Very good. Any other discussion? All in favor of the, uh, were you at that point to vote on it? Yep. yep. All in favor of the consent agenda, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. And the consent agenda passes. Sorry, that's a, that's a yes vote. I didn't yep. re register. Ten voting yes, none voting no. Agenda number 2021-337, 2022 2022-155, 2022-157, and 2022-173 remain tabled during committee. Is there any action on any Mayor. of those? Alderman Hanauer. I'd like to bring out 2021-337 uh, uh, and 2022-155 to debate, please. Okay. What do those ordinances pertain to? One is the, uh, uh, well, is that the one we were talking about, Mayor, the solicitation one, or is, is that uh, the? No, that's in, I think that's on the agenda already. Okay, I, I strike that, and I, I want to bring out 2022-155 uh, pool permits. Second the motion. Do you second Alder. both of them, Alderman? Uh, he's just going to pull out. 2022-155. Not 337. Not, yep. not right. 337. Thank you. And been seconded? Second here, McMillan. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is ordinance number 2022-155, an ordinance amending chapter 170, section 17.10.21 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended pertaining to pool permits. Is there a motion? A uh, motion to uh, uh, approve. Second. The move and second, any discussion? Uh, Alderman Redpath. Uh, uh, my my uh, request to speak was to bring 2022-173 off for uh, consideration. Okay. Sorry. We'll go back to that one. Do you have a second on that, Mayor? Second. I second it. Uh, there's been moved and second bring 2022-173 out of committee as well. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Both say nay. Motion carries. Uh, Alderman Hanauer. Um, I'm for discussion on 155. Okay. Are we good? Are we there? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, what this is about is we have uh, quite a lot of um, pool permits that are given. Currently, I believe they're a year and uh, uh, to build a pool. I've, I've had a lot of uh, pools that, excuse me, were um, that have been sitting for almost a year with nothing done to them. Uh, I've gotten a lot of calls from neighbors, gotten a lot of calls from people that have the pool sitting. Um, I've talked to quite a lot of pool companies. Uh, they think the six months is fine. On a rare occasion when they have a, a you know, a, just a crazy big pool with a pool house and all that, um, it may exceed the six months, but I don't think it should. I don't. I don't think that that this should affect too many of them. I think where the problem is is we have people that get get uh, supply. They they say supply issues, but when you've got at one time, I think one company had or at one time the city had 27 open pool um, permits waiting to be have something done. They were digging in December. And then they sit all, all, all winter and not with nothing to be done. And they know they have a year <laughs> to, to do it. All this is trying to do is to get, get the pool companies to, um, you know, kind of keep rein things in and keep, you know, do things in a, in a timely fashion. It's just not fair to the neighborhoods. It's not fair to the, to the people that sign up for pool. So. Alderman Donlin. Yeah. Thank you, mayor. Uh, you know, a few years ago, we had an issue where, in, in Ward 9, where an individual, I think I brought this up before, uh, took over two years to build a, to, to build a pool. The guy was doing it himself. Uh, it was a big hole in the ground, uh, a safety hazard, a eyesore, 
just terrible for the neighborhood. And uh, we found out that there was nothing in the covenants that could be done. There was nothing at the time that could be done in the city code. So we put in this, uh, put in the one year limitation as well as uh, an opportunity to increase the amount of time, you know, for extra fees. Alderman, this is one of those things where uh, we've been now presented with uh, an additional problem. Uh, I intend on supporting this. I think it makes sense and I appreciate you bringing it forward. Thank you. Alderman Repat. Um, I, I support this ordinance, but um, Alderman Hanauer, is this, uh, I, I believe the permits go to the homeowners. Is that correct? Well, it, it's, it's both ways. And um, I, I want to get this going because right now I, I want to come back later and try to do some, do it to where the permits are, are done by the, the pool company itself. I don't know. I, I've, I talked to Matt a little bit about it. Um, and we've got to, I, I, I got to talk to Mr. Zirkel about it because I do want to make sure that the pool companies are responsible for the permits on this. Because they could care less. I mean, they, they, they're, they're going to open up as many pools as they can to tie up the money, tie up the pools, right. and then they're going to go get some more bids and do some more. But my intent, to, the reason why I wanted to go ahead and go forward with it was because we're getting more and more pool permits now. This way that it's it sets it at six. The ones that are already out there, they're they're stuck for a year. We're not going to be able to fix that. Um, but these, at least, we get it for six months, and we'll come back. and And I've just got to. We've got to figure out how we we get. And and Mr. Zirkel, we just got to figure out how we get the pool companies to be responsible for the permits because also what it does is when they get ready to go, they can get the permit. It's not the you know rather than have the the owners go get a permit four weeks before um, they're ready to go and that way the time's ticking so but I, I do plan on coming back with the with an amendment to this you, you get the justice Mike I understand party. no okay. I totally All understand right. thank you Alderman McMinimum yeah so you're offering no amendments tonight no I have no amendments tonight um, I we just want to get this on the books well I'm sorry, I, you know, I, uh, I've talked to some of the pool operators, including the, the big two that do most of these, and I think they're expecting some amendments, so um, I can't vote for this without the amendments. I think, you know, a lot of the, 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 the pool, uh, the way I read this is if you want 60 days, it costs you $300, and if you want another 60 days after that, it's $500. I think those um, um, additional building permits are excessive, in relation to the circumstances that the pool bill is oftentimes faced. It can be a weather condition, it can be a supply uh, issue. Uh, I was hoping we're getting some, a, a compromise here. Um, so that's the reason for my no vote. I, I, I think I agree with your purpose here to get uh, some incentive to get the work done faster. But I was just hoping for, um, to, to have some more compromise on the, the extent of the extension fees. My, can I respond yes. real quick? Go ahead. Okay. My response to that, and I've talked to talked to the big pool companies as well. I, th I think that they have to do a better job of if they know that they can't get the pool, the pool structure. Then why dig the pool? If they know that they're concrete, you know, a lot of times they get the pools in right away because otherwise you dig a hole, the hole just fall in. But they'll get the, the pool structure in right away. And then it sits because they don't have the concrete people or, or whatever. It, 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 to me, it's more about planning. And if you don't have that, then you don't start the project. Um, you know, o O'Shea's are not going to start a project if they know they can't get the, get the material. It, it, because they don't want people just sitting and it's not fair to the homeowners, and it's not fair to the to the neighborhoods and the neighbors. So, um, I, I just think it's more about planning. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. The ordinance <coughs> passes uh, nine voting yes, one voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-158, an ordinance appointing Brian McFadden to the Springfield Economic and Community Development Commission. Chair, will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-158 on final passage. So moved. Second. 
Been moved and second. Any discussion? Alderwoman DeCento? Um, yes. Thank you, Mayor. I'm voting for these four because we, this was an agreement that we made. <clears throat> Um, but going forward, I'm just stating it here and now, I will not vote for anyone, for any board, for any deal made if they haven't at least reached out to us to let us know why they can't be here in person and if they can't be here in person. I mean, I understand things come up. Um, a simple email would have done the trick and we didn't hear from two of the people on that, that we're voting for. But this was the deal that was struck, so I'm voting for it. Thank you. But I won't in the future. Thank you. Alderman Williams. Yes, yeah, so I think it's two weeks that we've been waiting um, for the nominees to come and get appointed on our board. Um, one did come last week. She respected us. She came before us and, and presented herself to us in case we had questions or we had anything. I think we should either hold these until they come and be contingent on they get on this board when they decide to respect us as a city council and come before us even if they had an agreement. I second that. Because I feel, um, I, I feel disrespected right now. Uh, I know just from personal experience trying to get on their boards, um, <laughs> and, and that's not even my issues. I have questions, legitimate questions, as a city council member, and I think they, you, okay, the agreement happened, that's fine. I'm not here to say, not to put them on the board. I'm here to say, come and respect us and follow the process. So that's why I can't support it right now until they come and decide to give us our opportunity to do our jobs. Thank you. Alderman McMenamum. Um, so do we have any answers from, uh, let's just take them one at a time as they come up. Did Mr. McFadden uh, give any reason why he couldn't be here tonight? Uh, not directly. Uh, I think they holding with the position that uh, you know they're representing the uh, governing bodies that they have been selected by, and uh, everybody knows Alderman, or I'm sorry, Treasurer Alio and uh, Brian McFadden. But as far as uh, the reason, um, they're just pointing to the agreement that was struck for the TIF, and that they're representing uh, one instance, the county board; the other one is Capital Township. Uh, Mr. Mayor. To your recollection, was the agreement to expand the size of the Economic and Community Development Commission, or was the agreement to approve whoever those other entities nominated? Yeah, it's both. I told them that it has to come before City Council for approval. So, uh, you know, but they understood that, uh, one, I agreed to, yes, the expansion of the board, and, uh, that had to be codified with uh, city council approval, but you know I use the school district as an example. That uh, you know they make the recommendation; they're the recommending body, so it is a formality with regards to that. And um, so that's where that discussion went. Most recently, the discussions were you know we had the person from the school district come up and residency was questioned, things of that nature. But you know the council approved it, so it's more the formality side of it. So. Um, you never said to these individuals that you control the city council, is that correct? You never said you could, <laughs> you would guarantee a vote. <laughs> Corporation council, you care to answer that? <laughs> he was there on the discussions, but no. So I since would you, never say, I would, yeah, that'd be, uh, that'd see, be a lark, wouldn't it? <laughs> they would be. So since you can't guarantee a vote to them, um, we're just exercising our authority as independent-minded elected council members. So I, I was prepared to vote yes for some of these if they would show up um, or give a reason why they can't be here. I know that this has been a long meeting. If they're going to show up, I think maybe we could add a courtesy, move it to the front of the meeting if they did want to show up. But I can't, um, I can't vote yes to, to uh, I guess, three of these tonight because of um, them not being willing to participate in city government the way they're supposed to when they're nominated. Any other, uh, Alderman Williams, back to you. Is that right? Sorry about this. So may, maybe they could send two new names who are willing to, to show up. And then that uh, taxing body is still represented. I mean, they, it doesn't just consist of those names. 
So, um, and I, I don't think we agreed to a name being on the board per se. It's just that taxing bodies could, you know, be expanded and, and send their person. So maybe the option can be for them if they don't want to come before us. They'll just send two new names and those people come. Well, Corporation Council, you care to? We tried that with that, the Board that, of Health. Too, that's going to be their preference. It's just going to be like a ping pong match where they're not going to send a different name. And but they're not coming. I think, but Corporation Council, if you'd like to uh, share your opinion, that'd probably be good. Uh, your mic's not on. We need to hear you loud and clear. Uh, very good, thank you. Uh, I was simply going to say you may recall that this was discussed at some length uh, throughout the process that they would designate someone. Uh, our position had always been that they would be affirmed by the council, but they would be subject to them uh, being able to bring the name forward, their designee forward. But it was <clears throat> clear that the designee really is just representing the taxing body. It's not quite the same as an individual. They're here at the designation of that taxing body. So it would seem to me some deference uh, should be uh, made to that taxing body's choice since that person is here to represent the taxing body, uh, not as an individual. So, uh, so just to follow up to you, uh, Mr. Consul, so what, what you're saying to me is that uh, Brian McFadden's up for this appointment, but he, he may not be the one to actually attend the meetings. He can send a representative or kind of like how we do on Springfield Regional Planning. Is that, is that how, how they operate it and what we're saying? No, we, uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, Mr. McFadden would be their person, their, their representative on the board, and he would be present to cast his vote. They don't really allow uh, proxies, you know, for another person to be under the the. Just EDC wanted to make sure rules. I was thinking right. Okay. And, and I believe you, you are correct, sir. Thank you. Alderman Gregory. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A um, couple questions. With, along with this, you have two, two at-large um, bids, am I correct? Um, correct. Appointments. Um, the, the health department just, and I guess this would be a question for corporation council. Was there, um, an agreement with the health department that it would only be one year that we would be able to serve Do you know, with that, with that county health department agreement? The, um, are you referring to the, uh, Same. the board? Yeah, the board. I'm sorry. Uh, just very briefly, there is some history to that originally, uh, when the, uh, consolidation occurred between the city health department with the county. There was an intergovernmental agreement that was done that uh, guaranteed in that agreement uh, to provide two members designated by the city council as members on the county health department board, the, the operating board. However, uh, the agreement also provided that that appointment would expire after a period of time, meaning that the their position was it uh, would not uh, it would not be uh, a permanent arrangement. Uh, however, the law, the state law, allowed them to make it permanent. Uh, and in fairness to the county, what ended up happening, or what their position was, they failed to make it permanent at the time. They should have amended uh, their uh, county provisions relating to the board and did not. Uh, the state's attorney's office advised us, which I do not agree with. I uh, we did have that discussion at some length that the state law did not allow them to go back and correct that. Uh, they felt there was a time frame that limited their ability to act. Uh, however, uh, their final position was that they felt that the statute did not let them go back and amend even if they wanted to. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you for and that. It has to do with the number of boards. I believe there are eight members. The statute allowed them to make it 10. At the time that the intergovernmental agreement was done, it provided for 10. But uh, their position is they did not vote to change the county code to 10 at that time. But they could. It, it is, but it is they our, could. But it is our view that the one-year issue that they're relying on, uh, that was not a limitation for their action. However, the state's attorney's office uh, took an opposite view. Does this and the county has followed that, uh, followed that advice. All right, final, final two. Does this agreement have any contingencies on years time frame where we can always come back and change it? If, if this, this doesn't work, work, or is this permanent forever? The, uh, 
you may recall that the council adopted the changes to our city code right. that provided for the change to the Economic Development Commission to provide for the representatives to be designated with the affirmance of the city council. So to be designated by the taxing body and then to be affirmed by the city council action. So that is in our city code. But there, each, each designee serves for a three-year period just like the other members. Thank you. I, my, my final thought is, you know, I, I did talk to two of these these individuals, and one of them is, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Adio, and you know, I, I, I um, and not a man of, of, of short on words. And uh, we met, and we had a, a very. Uh, he challenged me on some things on the city. I challenged him on some things at, at township. Um, but one of the things I appreciated for him um, w was at least having a willingness to reach out to me and have a conversation. I haven't. Uh, spoken to Mr. McFadden or Mr. Terry, I can't say the last name, but Mr. Terry. Um, uh, you know, the, my, my only f worry with this is, is that um, it's for development and, and, and looking at the east side of town and looking at the inner core. And, and that was my only worry. And, you know, we had a good conversation. Um, and I think, you know, f for me, you know, to get this over with, I, you know, me and the mayor had some 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 conversations about this this deal, and you know I I, I can't say I, I would have went with it, but it is a deal, and I do trust in him um, to make a good deal. And and you know I, I had a good conversation with Mr. Alio, and um, I don't know why he's not here. I would like him to be here, and, and everybody to be here. I do think because you know, he going sent forth, a message. I do think going forth that we need to um, have people on the board to at least come and at least sit. And if we have any questions, they don't necessarily have to talk, but somebody may have some questions, and I think that's the least that somebody can do. So I appreciate you for your time. Alderman Redpath. It's my intent to call the question, but I'll yield to Alderman Fulgenzi if he has some comments before I call the question. Thank you. Uh, I just don't understand why this the insistence to have this particular individual come and present himself before the board. We've never done it in six years with any other person. There's been numerous instances where people didn't come, couldn't come for one reason or another, and we've never insisted on it. I'm just wondering why it is with this individual. I mean, if, if we want to have him be here, we ought to put it in our rules that this is what they have to do in order to get voted on. But that's not the case. We've never done it. So I think there's more, well, I, I just don't think it's, it's something that we ought to spend a lot of time on since we've never done it before. That's not correct. All the way back to Minima. Well, I don't think we break, anyone who votes no is not breaking any agreement. The agreement was to expand the body, the Economic Development Commission body, and I think that if anyone had insisted that an appointee show, they just about always show up. They just about always show up. And if anyone had thought that was a deficiency for someone not to show up, they could have made the point. But these are, this is a different situation here. Um, this is, Sorry, these but are I the, don't see where this these, is a different These individuals situation. have Hill obstructed Hill. our at attempt to expand TIF uh, districts and, and uh, the timeline. And, uh, and we have some questions about it. And I know you served on the county board. You like a lot of these individuals, perhaps. And I like some of them, too. But they still have to show respect for this council when we perform our duties to review who should be appointed and who should not be appointed. Mayor, I'll take my turn now. Alderman Hanauer and then Alderman Williams and Alderman Rupp. Rupp. <laughs> Here's the Hold deal. The question. You, can, you can say what you want, but right. we made a deal. Right. We made a deal. Forfeit our responsibilities. The mayor made a deal, and as what, and, and Mr. Zirkel, you were there. The deal was struck. Okay. Now, probably what should happen on these kinds where we have to add people is they shouldn't have to come through city council. They should just go straight on. If that's who the the, the people want, you know, then so be it. But if we go forward, if we if these guys don't don't pass. We, we've reneged on the deal. No, they did it to Based themselves. On, Joe, I, I've got the floor. Yep. Quit ahead, making ahead, comments. Ahead. You do it to me, my brother. Go ahead, Alderman Hanar. The, the, but the bottom line is 
we've got we've got a deal made. That's it. Now you you turn them down, and next time we need something real important at the state house, ask Larry Luster what that what this does if we don't follow through on our deal. Ask him. And Ralph, he, what does it do if we do follow through and they still decide not to help us? Well, uh, what what happens? But then? I can we we can't look at we we set a deal. They 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 did their their part of the deal. It's our turn to do ours. If we don't do that, we've lost credibility. I don't care what you say. There, there's not a lot that that's a, that that you have in politics, but you you got you got to keep your credibility. And uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I realize you guys don't like these guys. I don't like some of the people it's, that get put on. It's I don't personal. care. It's not personal. I'm not putting it's out press personal. releases against these guys. They're doing that against me personally. Well, they so, didn't put me on either, Kristen. That's that's not. Yep. That's Follow true. the question. Alderman Williams, then we'll yes, call so, it. So I, I really want to answer uh, John's question. So, Alderman, uh, you know, these ain't, ain't average citizens. This is Joe Aglio, elected official in his own right, over township. Over, I mean, everybody else who's serving ain't in those kind of positions to where economically they may have a view that may be different than our economic interests for the city of Springfield. So I have conflict type issues. Uh, uh, Brian McFadden, not an ordinary citizen. He holds positions that could sway one way or the other economic decisions that might be contrary to what, the, what we do on economic development. I don't want you to think that it's personal. It's that they should respect us enough to come so I can ask them about their views on certain things. After all, they only are trying to get on because of a view about TIFs. I mean, let's be real with this. That's why they went on, you know, so that now, as another alderman said to me, well, what perfect place should they be? He may be right. Maybe they'll get on and this all may get better. But we, we can't talk to them. We can't get the answer. We got to be special like Sean and get special meetings. I mean, we either going to operate as a body or we're not going to operate as a body because Joe Alio and Brian McFadden hold positions of power you know, in other, all kinds of other ways that could be a conflict with economic development. That's why I feel they should come and, and, and we be allowed to question them. They have the votes, they're gonna get put on. So what really is behind them not coming? What, why are they not coming? <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Mayor. Or unless you want a Alderman Fulgenzi to respond. No. <laughs> nobody, nobody getting in front of me again. <laughs> Calling the question. To to vote Mr. for it or don't vote for it. it to me. It's the consequences of what we vote. Second vote your call. conscience. Call the question. All in favor say aye or vote aye. aye. Are yes. these individuals, Mayor? Yes. For uh, Brian McFadden, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. <clears throat> and the Ordinance passes, seven voting yes, three voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-159, ordinance appointing Terry Sherholtz to the Springfield Economic and Community Development Commission. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-159 on final passage. Well move. Second. Good move and second. Uh, discussion? I don't know if he's here by chance. No, but I, did I wanted ask to, that he attend I want to thank him for his email. Uh, I view the difference between uh, every, I think the round the horseshoe knows Joe Alio and um, Brian McFadden, um, as Alderman Williams said, because of their position. Uh, Terry Shorterholt's not uh, as well recognized, but he did, he is a graduate of Griffin High School with uh, Alderman Hanauer and myself. Class so Alderman, do you want to attest to his credibility? Yeah, he's Yeah, he's he worked at man. the state and finance and uh, he's retired now, I believe. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to, he's the representative for the sanitary district. He must I, be I, awesome if he went to high school with you two. No, I, <laughs> I've worked. He must be amazing. I, 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 will, just, I will just say this, because Terry, Terry and I have, we, we've had a lot of fun together, and, and uh, um, there's, I would just say he's, a, he's, he's very, he, he was a very good employee at, at the state of Illinois. He ran uh, the, um, I think the real property division at one time. 
and uh, did a lot of the leases and, and that. So uh, he, he's got that expertise. And be, besides anything beyond that, I'm not I'm not going any farther. So. Class of '79. <laughs> that's more to protect Woo! me. That's more to protect me than him. So thank you. All the men make minimum. So same question as before. Did this individual attempt to communicate why he could not be here tonight? Uh, no, I don't think yes, so. Yes, no, we received an email. Yes, we did. Could, could you explain? I don't think I received that email. Could you say yes. what it, explain what it said? Just, we had asked him to come a few weeks ago, and he said he wasn't able to come a few weeks ago. That he had a conflict. I, I, for tonight, I'm not. And since the class of 79 is vouching for him, I believe him. <laughs> hey, he was with your brother, too. <laughs> so we sent out new invitations. All the more reason I wouldn't vote for Terry Schaefer. <laughs> So just, uh, I still got the floor, I think. So we uh, asked, we sent out new invitations, new requests for this meeting, and this individual did not respond to this uh, most recent request. Is that right? Correct. So uh, these nominees are not special people. I think we, uh, they, they're they disrespecting this council. Some people want that to happen, but I think, <laughs> I'm glad there were three no votes last time. Now watch it. I can't vote yes to this. Any Call other question. discussion? Call the question. All in favor, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. <laughs> Don't worry, Joe. You're going to get a no on. And the ordinance passes seven <clears throat> voting yes, three voting no. Next item on the agenda is appointing an ordinance, uh, agenda number 2022-161. Ordinance appointing Joe Alio to the Springfield Excuse Economic and Community Development Commission. Chair will entertain a motion. Leslie. Leslie. What's that? You're getting oh, anxious okay. from oh, I skipped one. Leslie Scrow. Okay, sorry about that. Next item on the agenda is 2022-160, an ordinance appointing Leslie Scrow to the Springfield Economic Community Development Commission. Chair will entertain a motion. Place agenda number 2022-160 on final passage. Moved. Second. Second. So moved and second. Any discussion? Did she go to Griffin too with you, Ralph? <laughs> no, she's not from here. Her brother went oh, to Christ King with then. Her, her husband. <laughs> But she did attend the council la or the right. committee last week. Yeah, that's great. Let's go. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-161, an ordinance appointing Joe Alio to the Springfield Economic and Community Development Commission. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-161 on final passage. So moved. Second. So moved and second. Any discussion? Uh, same question. Did this individual uh, tell us why he can't be here tonight? Uh, no. no. Okay, thank you. Did you go to high school with him? Uh, <laughs> Hope not. He was a year ahead. Older. He's an All-American. My so. son delivered his newspaper, but that won't make a difference. <laughs> uh, well, I Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. This is going to be different. There you got to vote. Uh, I'm going to vote yes, but I can get it done. Okay. So it passes six voting yes, three voting no, and one voting present. There. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is 2022-163, an ordinance amending Chapter 80, Section 80.08, A, B, and C, and Section 82.02, A, 1 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended pertaining to pedestrians on roadways. Chair will entertain a motion. Place agenda number 2022-163 on final passage. So move. That's not ready yet. That's not ready yet. Uh, talked about. Uh, move for discussion, I guess. Well, it's not ready. If it's not ready, the, let's hold the, it. Yeah, just very briefly, we had um, done quite a bit of research and received information uh, from various people on it. Uh, we have drafted an ordinance that focused, uh, was more narrow, focusing on intersections. A uh, request has been made that we go back and take a look at also traffic counts. In other words, uh, maybe intersections in excess of a certain number, like 10 or 20,000. So we are in the process of doing that. We have received all of the safety information from both public works and the police department on the intersections with the most number of accidents. Uh, so we're also then uh, looking at the uh, actual traffic counts. So we're holding this. So, so what, what, we can't even do a simple loitering ordinance anymore without getting sued because what they're doing is they're loitering. 
and we and should be able to we should be able to stop that. I'm sorry, but this isn't about panhandling. It's not. It's about safety. People are loitering in areas they should not be loitering in, and we should be able to stop that. Well, there are uh, all of the loitering laws in the U.S. were invalidated many years ago uh, by uh, federal court action. U.S. Supreme Court, I think there's a decision on that. Uh, so loitering meaning standing around without uh, a particular purpose or otherwise, uh, most of those provisions both uh, across the country have been invalidated. The issue here is the question of the ability to uh, restrict to a certain specified area based on safety concerns of persons soliciting in certain areas. And we've looked at a multiplicity of the uh, ordinances from various cities. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of litigation across the country on this very issue uh, where various ordinances have been invalidated. Uh, and so we need to be uh, correct and very uh, specific on any restrictions regarding solicitations based on uh, safety concerns, and those safety concerns have to be objective, just not a generic uh, question uh, of the mere fact that there's an intersection. And inter interestingly, uh, we have gotten information from Public Works, there's approximately 4,150 intersections in Springfield. Of those, 370 are, uh, uh, have signals. Of those, we're doing a further breakdown on those that have medians and then also to get the traffic counts to make sure that there's a uh, basis uh, for taking actions that basically restrictions restricts the ability to solicit within and around that intersection. Well, the, so oh, what yeah. happens? What happens if someone gets hit? We're we're going to get sued. So 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 what what what's happening here? The way I see it is. We can't put anything on the on the, the rules on the on the on the laws to pre prevent us from getting sued if someone gets hit. But it, it, this is well, crazy. The, it's, yeah, the, it, it's very uh, for the city uh, to have liability for a, a particular uh, a particular individual uh, that you know uh, would. Uh, be involved in an accident, even an automobile accident. Uh, it's because of the way the uh, various laws are constructed. Uh, the action of the individual, it's not the action of the city, the fact that there's an intersection, the action of the individual is what is the proximate cause of the damage, the conduct of the individual. So the city being uh, sued in that context is very limited in nature. If, for example, uh, the city would be doing, uh, I'll pick a very specific topic, would be doing road work and not mark the road work properly according to DOT regulations. That would be a circumstance where if an accident occurred, the city potentially could have liability. But as a general rule, um, if the signalized lights or the uh, uh, signage and so on are properly done, then what, what is done by an individual, you know, a car hitting another car, fender bender, or striking a uh, pedestrian, obviously very unfortunate, uh, typically that would not lead to a uh, liability of the city because of the intervening actions of the individuals. Any other discussion? So this is being held, Mayor? Yeah, it'll be held. Motion to uh, hold this in committee. Motion to hold or this just in committee. to hold it on the agenda? Yeah, yes, sir. Right? Yeah, I'll second Alderman Gregory's motion to hold Second. It. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Uh, next item is 2022-173, an ordinance amending Chapter 96, Section 96.045 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended pertaining to docks and seawalls. So move, uh, I believe we have amendments. Correct. That is correct. Second. Uh, do we need to go over the amendment? Uh, yeah, certainly. Yep. Just very briefly, the, uh, the proposed amendment uh, basically strikes out the uh, original uh, section relating to the height of the dock. Uh, there was a meeting uh, earlier, I guess last week, relating to the uh, uh, 
uh, input from the neighborhood association and so on, and then also revising the language regarding uh, the requirement for instances where there are docks or seawalls or boathouses proposed. It would require a site plan to be submitted that would be reviewed by planning and zoning and then be subject to the approval of the general manager of the utility and then also the mayor. So what the intent is is that it's going to put a little more process, organized process, in the review uh, of those applications. And there's been some concern about uh, some, some inconsistencies on how the interpretations have been made with both locations of seawalls and the locations of the uh, docks and boathouses. So the purpose behind it was to have a little more formalized process where a site plan would actually be required to be reviewed. And that, is, that was the amendment that came from the discussion with the Homeowners Association last week. Do you need a motion on the amendment? Yes, yes. sir. I'll make a motion to accept the amendment. Second. Okay. Move and second. Any discussion on the amendment? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Uh, motion on the ordinance as amended. So move. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion as amended, uh, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. Ordinance passes as amended. Ten voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-186, an ordinance authorizing the transfer of fiscal year 22 funds from one account to another for the Office of Public Utilities. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-186 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the I vote yes. Thank you. Ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is 2022-195, an ordinance vacating a portion of the right-of-way of Hazeldell Road to the Illinois National Bank of Springfield as trustee under the provisions of a certain trust agreement dated May 4th, 1976, and known as trust number 13-04314-00, to eliminate an encroachment, Chair will entertain a motion to recess the regular City Council meeting to hold a public hearing regarding the vacation of a portion of right-of-way. So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Public hearing is now open. Does anybody wish to address the City Council on the vacation of this portion of right-of-way? Motion Chair. to adjourn. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded to adjourn the public hearing and reconvene the regular city council meeting and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-195 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. Gregory's yes. Yeah. And the motion passed 11 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-202, ordinance authorizing various interagency budgetary transfers to reconcile end-of-year budget levels with fiscal year 2022 <coughs> expenses for the Office of Budget and Management. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-202 <coughs> on final passage. So move. Second. The move and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the motion passes, nine voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-203, an ordinance authorizing a supplemental appropriation in the amount of six million $600,800 for a year-end reconciliation of fiscal year 2022 for the Office of Budget Management. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-203 on final passage. So moved. Second. Good move and second. Any discussion? Mayor, wasn't that an uh, amendment adopted during the last meeting to change that to 6440-800? Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> that, that is correct, and that will be reflected in the final ordinance. That was adopted, you may recall, at the committee. Uh, it excluded a uh, one line item, I believe it was for police, and the committee adopted that amendment. So the correct amount is six million six forty. Did you say Have the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Six Griffin. million four hundred forty thousand eight hundred dollars. Any other discussion? All in favor of the uh, motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. The ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-207, an ordinance authorizing execution of a contract with Honeywell International, Inc. for purchase of the land and all improvements situated at the southwest corner of 11th Street and Ash Street for an amount not to exceed $75,000 and closing costs an amount not to exceed $5,000 for total amount not to exceed $80,000. Chair, um, I think we wanted to amend this. Corporate yes, Council. Um, I think one of the questions from the, uh, the committee is that we simply add the contingency. It is contingent on the uh, final review of the environmental cleanup requirements. You may recall that was discussed at the uh, committee, so I think you can approve the ordinance and we'll add a section that said this approval is subject to the uh, final cost of the uh, environmental cleanup, since that's still being uh, worked on. I'll make the motion to amend that. There's a second for that amendment. I'll, I'll second it. Move and second. Discussion. Alderwoman Conley. Yeah. A um, couple things. First of all, we had we had a conversation last week where this cleanup could be possibly over half a million dollars, close to half a million dollars. Um, I, I can't, in good conscience, even with this amendment, vote for something with that much of an open-ended obligation at the end, at the tail of it. So. Um, e even as amended this, I, I feel that there are other locations we should be considering. Um, <coughs> all due respect to the, to the chief, I, I think that the uh, extenuating circumstances around the environmental status of this property um, make it yeah. inappropriate nope. for the city to be purchasing. Honeywell's still in operation. They can f clean up their mess. We should not be on the hook for this, and I don't think we should be considering purchasing something that uh, an existing corporation has an obligation to fix. So um, with all due respect, I'm going to be a no on the amendment. I'm going to be a no on this ordinance. Well, if, uh, if it pleases the uh, city council, we could just hold it as we did the other ordinance, just hold it on the agenda. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Please. Make that motion. Until we get the cleanup uh, costs. Make a motion to Can everybody hold speak first though, before we make any motion? Go ahead, Alderman Gregory. Sorry. Thank you. I, and, and I respect everyone's opinion. I just feel like that you know, um, so are we looking at another site or are we just holding on this to wait till this get done, Chief? Are you looking at another site? I know, I, I, I'm sorry. You ain't got to you ain't got to get up. Oh no, he should. Get up. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've been at this for a while, so I, I know you stuck on on this one and you want this one to work and you believe this one will work. We're making a sixty year decision. We have obviously uh, exhausted a lot of different areas over there that we've looked at. Um, are there other areas, are there other uh, options uh, that we could make work? You can always make something work, but when you have the spot that is the right spot, then I think that you need to at least let it play out as far as uh, let's get all of the information, get all of the information back. Uh, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I don't think that we should do, uh, that we should uh, exclude this location until we have all the information. We just don't have all the information right now. I mean, obviously, if, if it can't be done, it can't be done. We'll, we will find another place to do it. Um, but I, I would prefer to, to put it where I think that it goes best. Thank you. Um, I, I, my final points would be is that, you know, we, we move forward. I, I, I don't think we should do anything further than any other firehouses or any other fire action. Until we get this back, we shouldn't we shouldn't go build the one on eight. We shouldn't look at the one out west until we at least address the one that we was promised we'd fix first. I think that makes sense. We've done a lot. We've done a lot of movement. Now this one's stuck. It's stuck. I, I understand what you're saying, but uh, I don't think that we should stop the wheels from turning I, as I far as that. building these other places because 
what we're going to have to do for one of it, let's say that for whatever reason, 11th and Ash does not prove to be the prudent place for it to go. We don't know if the other options are not going to run into similar issues. You know, there's areas over there by Fiat Alice that have have areas that uh, are big enough and are cleared to house a firehouse. So are they going to have contaminated soil too? We have no idea. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that holding uh, eight and thirteen hostage um, over whether or not how soon we get this. I think we're talking about a, a matter of weeks before we get this back anyway. So that's a relatively uh, short time. And all I'm saying is, is that <clears throat> for the people, for our firefighters that stuck in over there, that this is supposed to be priority. Mm -hmm. We made steps to address everything else. Eight can get out. They can go do what they need to do. Six is covered up. The people in the community need their fire. Their fire. They, I understand they what need you're it. saying. You, I just you, and I, your guys are covered up. So all I'm saying is, is that I just think it sets a bad look for the community when we keep moving, we keep moving, we keep moving, and I just think we should pause for a second, at least until we get an answer, and say, "Oh, Honeywell doesn't work. We're gonna go to another spot." And I, I, I just so how long do you think that we should wait? As long as we get until we get the honey. Well, you said it'd be about two weeks. Two I'm weeks until we get that back. And so then if if that if it comes back and it's not a prudent place, this this body decides that it's not a prudent we'll place. If we want to put it. We move on. So we go to another one and then we got to wait another six months. Do I look like I'm joking? Stuff. I'm not laughing. I'm not playing. I'm not. This is no game to me. I don't I don't know, so why, I don't know why, why you're, you're upset smiling. with me. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain. I think... Go ahead, Chief. I, I don't want to hear why. I, I, my colleagues are very, very, I, very. I'm, I'm not asking... talking to you. Let me finish. This is why I'm getting a little. Because when my colleague upset gets upset, he never gets upset. The director showed him respect. He stopped when he was talking. So I, I'm just asking for the same thing. Yeah, I got a little uh, uh, upset. But I'm not mad. I respect you. All I'm saying is, is for the community around Harvard Park to the east of 9th Street, we're setting a bad president. I'm not blaming you. I'm just stating my opinion of what I would like to see. I would like to see some more action. You say we're going to probably have it in about two weeks. I don't want to hear nothing else about fire, fire, Firehouse until we hear about Honeywell. I think that's only fair. That's my opinion. Understood. Thank you, sir. Alderman Desenzo. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Alderman Gregory, I, I agree to, with you to a point because I think we're all over the map with these firehouses. When I talked to your union president last week, he said we only need to build one new firehouse. So we've been, set, we've been told that we need three new firehouses, and he said number six is just fine. It should stay where it is, and it's just fine, and instead, we should move nine out to where 13 is supposed to be and keep nine where it is because that's where the population is shifting and that there's plenty of coverage where we have right now. So are we building three? Are we building one? Do we know what the heck we're doing? That's my concern at this point because this is a lot of money and these are 60 year decisions. And if we don't even need to be building three firehouses, then what are we doing? Is there a question? I mean, yeah, no. what did you want yeah, to Yeah, what are we doing? The question is, I, why I've are already we made a proposal three? on what I think needs to be done uh, as far as moving this fire department forward for our community. Uh, there is expansion to the west. There is not expansion to the east. The east has great coverage. I think that we, I want to provide new stations on the east side. I want to make sure that the people on the west side have the right kind of coverage. But we've provided a plan. And if the plan is unpopular, then you can tell me to try again. But I've provided a plan. It's not a guess. We've worked hundreds of hours on this. I was appointed to this position because people sitting around this, this horseshoe thought that I was the person for the job. And now I've presented a plan, and it's getting a lot of arrows shot at it. I understand that. But I have provided you a plan. I provided you a data. If, if this is something that you don't want to move forward with, then you tell me, that's, and that'll be 
up to you. But I, I've I, provide, we've provided a lot of data. We've had experts come in and, and provide. And I've seen a lot of, not about firehouse location. And I've seen data that leaves a huge hole in service in the area around Ward 6. So that's, you know, or the future Ward 6 or you know, whatever, whatever we're talking about. So, you know, I, I've aired my concerns to you publicly, privately. I've said what I'm going to say. I'm going to vote how I'm going to vote. Sounds good. I don't know if you want to address the Ward 6 issue. Uh, the, the hole in Ward 6 right now does not have any residents per se in it. It's the, it's the uh, ground that's to the south of the Darcy's Pint area, which does not have uh, anything that will it necessitates six, coverage. But will it in 60 years? Well, I know that we need it in 6's district now, where 6 is at now. I, have, I do not have the ability to forecast what's going to happen in the next 60 years, but I do know that it took us 20-something years to provide coverage to the Southwest, which we know it needed, for, for us then to move a firehouse that provides coverage where there's nobody living right now does not seem prudent to me. But, and, uh, but get, Firehouse yeah. 13, I mean, there's, we're protecting dirt there as well, correct? But there's also several neighborhoods right there. There's no neighborhoods at all across from Darcy's Pine. But there are plans to put neighborhoods there and a large sports complex and a lot of other developments that are coming. I understand, I understand that, but what I'm trying to do is protect things that are already there with the first wave. We have to look forward. Should we put a firehouse in a place where we might have a development in five years or should we put a firehouse where was, that is already developed where we have a need? I think that we need to provide the service to the people who are already there. And as we move forward, we do have plans on moving, replacing all of these other stations. Uh, I have a comprehensive plan. I can come in and I can, and I can give a presentation on that. I'd be happy to do so. Uh, I've, had it in, I've had it locked and loaded for a couple of months now. Um, but I think that it's more prudent to make sure that we're providing the services to the people that are there now that need it versus the people that are not there yet. So uh, on that, uh, with regards to location 13 and the other locations, where did those concepts come from? Then we do analysis after analysis, and it was recommended in these studies that was made for it's by previous It's been recommended councils. since 99 or whenever it was. They were one of the first. Uh, we've had three different uh, analyses done by outside agencies, um, and I believe that the CPSM study does uh, also, they may not have done a study per se as far as uh, where the firehouses should go, but they did recognize that in the Southwest Corridor that there was a lack of services and uh, the type of response times that are necessary. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Williams. Well, I'm, I promise I'm, we're not going to do this again. Um, 13. I want them to have protection. I want them to have a new firehouse. But I'm still on. We own the land. But past that little spec, we're not in the city of Springfield. The road is not in the city of Springfield. And we're building a firehouse outside the city of Springfield where there's nothing there. You just said to Alderman DeCenso, she, across the street, there's, I don't want to build where there's nothing there. I looked at the proposed map even. You can even look at the proposed map. Look at there. There's Woodside. There's Orchard Spalding. There's the Speck. That's where our firehouse is. And then it's like we're, you know. So, again, m maybe I should be addressing the Nick's amendment and, and make an amendment for two houses instead of three because I'm still saying 13 is, is, is inappropriate because... It's being built not in the city. It is building across the street from where there's housing. And I am saying I want those people protected. But just because we own a speck of land don't mean we just, that's where we're going to put it and not consider that if a fire breaks out on that same street, they are going to respond to their neighbors. They're not going to wait for Chatham to come and take care of them. They're going to have to do the, the moral thing and go put out that fire, help those people. 
So since we know that and we decided as a council not to bring them in, it's inappropriate to put a brand, to put investment like that right there. Out there in the southwest corner, we, we should have picked other locations. I said this early on. So I guess, Mayor, I might be out of order. Maybe it's the next ordinance where I want to do an amendment for two houses yeah. instead of three. But so I'll, I'll yield. Alderwoman Conley. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and Chief, first of all, I want to say I, I, will, I, I got a notice. I had, we had an email. Um, this has been a long day for you. I understand we had two major fires that include two injured firefighters. So mm -hmm. um, despite all the heat around this council, I know that we all agree that um, our, our residents' safety, our firefighters' safety is, is critical. It, it really is. And, and please extend um, our best wishes uh, for recovery to your two firefighters who were injured tonight. Um, I, I do hope that there are, I'm assuming Red Cross is working with the families that were displaced. Okay, good. And, but again, we're talking about safety. So I, I appreciate holding this lot. I think it's in this ordinance on this lot. I think it's important that we have a complete and comprehensive understanding of what is in the soil on that property. Um, I don't have a, and once we get into that, we can have a little more information. Um, but I think the last thing we need to be do, doing right now is, is holding up other fire stations. And I know the fire station says eight. It's, it's, it's station eight. Um, and it is right now in Ward 8, and it will move to Ward 8. But I am relying, again, on our professional staff to tell us that that's where, that's where the housing has moved. That's where the development is. I know I have a number, even on that western edge of, my, of Ward 8, there are a number of senior living facilities that I want to make sure they have that four-minute coverage. So, yes, I'm going to advocate for my ward, but I'm also going to advocate for the entire city because this city will only be strong if every corner of the city is covered. Every corner. Every one. And, and it cannot be that we have extensive cut overlap in one area and another part of the city that has to wait and hope for that four-minute coverage, that four-minute response. Because two major fires today, how many of our engines were out today? Uh, on the second one, we had nine engines, two trucks, and several other auxiliary. We That's only had we had three. We had three engines covering the entire city, except for out. Uh, everything else was out uh, near Toronto Road. Yeah, and that's a significant response. Um, we need to make sure that this decision is not a political decision. It's not a my ward versus your ward decision. This is for entire safety of the entire city. So if there's a major fire in one part of the city and we don't have coverage there, we're losing, station, we're losing trucks from other stations and then we're, we're, we've, got fewer we've got a reduction in coverage for the rest of our community. These are our neighbors. Sean, I can get to your ward in 10 minutes. If, if I've got the lights, maybe 12 without. I promise you that's important to me. I have friends who live throughout this city. But I'm also concerned that we not build a fire station a, on soil, on a, on a ground that's contaminated. That's not safe for them, and it's not the appropriate response for the city. And, and B, I want to make sure that, that that station is located in the place where we're looking for all the expansion, for all the growth. We know Legacy Point's moving forward. I think that's on the next, next agenda. I mean, we're going to have significant development, and we want development in this community. <coughs> we want to build. We want to see Springfield strengthened. So, Chief, I just mostly want to say thank you for your calmness in this. I, I, I appreciate that you have put together a lot of plans. Um, I'm going to agree to disagree with you on, on this, this specific location at this time. Um, but I also I know that, that getting stations, getting soil samples back, getting those assessed and evaluated can take some time. And so it's important that that be done right. Um, if we hold this, I'm looking forward to clean clean reports coming back and moving forward. But until then, again, I, anyway, I, I appreciate all you've done for us. And again, please send best regards to your, all of your firefighters. I'm sure they've all had a, a long day. Will do. Thank, Thank you. you. Alderman Hanauer. Thank you. Uh, Chief, right now, as it, sta as it sits where, where we have uh, fire station six, what's the, with it being landlocked, what's the, what's the farthest, what's the longest uh, response time? How much does that add with it? 
I would say on average, it's probably 30 to 45 seconds, which okay, doesn't sound how, like it, a lot, but and, over and a course of hundreds of calls, that's I, significant. I understand that, but okay, so uh, from there, what's that get most of the most of the calls? They're, they're, they're still at what, four and a half minutes? They're still, uh, the, the goal actually uh, per NFPA standard is to, have, it is to be on scene within uh, four minutes on 90% of your calls. So, and that's what's our, what our goal is. I, I just say four minutes because it's more straightforward. But I would say less than five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but what you have to do is that with the uh, way that the, the rail project has gone is if you're going, uh, if you're going north, you have to go south no, to go I, north. I understand that. I right. just here, here's here's my point. If if any of you, any of you aldermen and alder women, if if we took the fire stations out and they were seven minutes or eight minutes to get to any of the houses in your in your ward, you'd go crazy. You would go absolutely berserk. Well, guess what? That's what I have. That's what I have. Now, Alderman Williams, you keep bringing up Spalding Orchard. Change Ge your location. And guess I'm guess that, what, that, Alderman? Alderman? We, I guarantee you that we pay or that we have a, a fire protection district contract where we get paid by all those people out there to provide them fire protection, just like we have in how many fire protection districts, Mayor, do we do we cover or or? Nine. So we have nine other fire protection districts that are not in the city of Springfield that we get money from to, to take care of their fire protection. Now, this one, if it's not in the city, I, I assumed it was in the city. If it isn't, it's going to get annexed because we got, we got it right, right there. But if any of you had seven-minute response time, eight-minute response time, whatever it is down at, down at uh, Piper, you guys would go crazy, and don't tell me you wouldn't, and you should. But, you know, Sean, I, I, I understand you want to hold it. I say we put everything in a package and go forward, and then that way we guarantee they're all going to get done. Nobody's going to get slighted. That's not my intention at all, but we need to move forward. We need to keep, if we, if we stop, guess what? The, all that's going to happen is this whole thing's going to die. The whole thing's going to die. And it's not fair to, to, to the people of, of Springfield, Illinois. It's certainly not fair to the, to the and, and with the map, who knows? You know, right now, some of them, you, you know, you guys might inherit one of the places that it's seven minutes. So... John really wants to talk, so I guess. <laughs> I just haven't figured this out yet. <laughs> so I guess I'll, I'll, but just just think about that. I'll Thank you. Gen Z. <laughs> Settle down, John. It'll be okay. <laughs> okay. He wants to well, talk double time. Basically, everybody's talking about fire districts and fires and so forth, but I had a gentleman die in my place. And uh, it wasn't from the food. <laughs> <laughs> but he actually expired. And if it wasn't for the fire department getting there within three and a half minutes, he would have been gone. They uh, actually, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Resuscitated. Paddled him. Yes. Mm -hmm. They paddled him four times at my place and ten more times on the way to the hospital. He still comes in every Saturday. Wow. But if, you talk about fires, but what about the personal injuries? What about the the heart attacks, the strokes? Well, it might be your food. The what? <laughs> it might be your food. I can't hear you. Yeah. But it might be your food. Okay. I didn't hear you. They're greasy and they're good. <laughs> She's complimenting but, your food. But burgers. the point yes. of it is, I think this four-minute response time is something we have to consider. And uh, I don't want to hold up any firehouses, not because of fires, but because of uh, personal injury, personal strokes, heart attacks. That's the thing that they go on 80, 85% of the time. And I think we need to recognize that. 
So I'm, I'm in favor of that. Thank, Thank you. you. With regards to this particular ordinance, uh, you know, I know everybody's concerned about the environmental impact, which we all should, but uh, if we don't uh, make this development happen there, then 30 years, that's what you're going to be looking at. So uh, we have to look at beyond the public safety aspect. It's an economic development aspect. I did get a uh, call recently from an individual that says crime up is up in the area. One of the ways that you turn crime around is invest in the area. And so that's why we want to make sure we vet this as thoroughly as possible. We will be contacting Honeywell to see if they uh, what they would be willing to do as uh, good corporate citizens and uh, approach that route. But uh, we'll come back and um, you know bring that forward to the council. And whatever the environmental mitigation is, for myself personally, I think we need to do it. But we'll see what that holds. I agree. Any other discussion? Alderman Redpath and Alderman McMinimum. Is it, uh, for Corporation Council, is it possible that we could pass this with the contingency that um, if, the, the, if it comes back, if the tests come back negative, that we can get out? That was the amendment. Well, that was the amendment. Okay. Oh, that is the amendment. I'm sorry. I'll I'll to, 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 be, to be clear, though, there, there is contamination on the site. Uh, they've got the proper EPA letters for the current... Uh, to be clear, to uh, to use it in its current format. The issue becomes the construction is, uh, uh, in the manner of the construction, the type of construction, type of use, is triggering a further review and potential cleanup. And the uh, to be, again, crystal clear, the uh, engineers have indicated a certain program in order they believe it will be accomplished, what the mayor has brought up and perhaps to be a little more subtle with it, uh, his suggestion, and I think it's a very good one, is to talk to Honeywell because they're never going to be able to sell the property right. in its current format because anyone would be digging up the soil to develop it. Therefore, that problem is going to be there, and the thought process is to talk to Honeywell about possibly absorbing part of that cleanup cost. And so, uh, and, and again, when just as a practical matter, if you would like to hold it for two weeks, if you want to pass it with a contingency saying... It is contingent on the, the final, you know, the final feasibility of the environmental cleanup. Uh, that certainly is a proper step for the council, if you would like to. I, un I understand the concerns of the council about the enormous amount of money, but I would like to pass it with the contingency, and that way we, that way, we're still moving forward and see what happens. And, and when will the discussions with Honeywell take place? Soon as tomorrow. Yes. But, can you uh, call them tonight? Well, we, we can yes, either do a cap on the environmental cleanup or come back with a plan that has to be approved by council. Uh, so it's whatever the pleasure of the group would be. And ordinarily, remember, what would happen is if there's a contingency, we still would be coming back with a contract for the cleanup, meaning that those numbers would be uh, uh, fully understood and and because uh, we'd have to get a contract well, to do the cleanup. And, and that's based on our discussions with Honeywell, though. Because Honeywell d decides they'll help us with the, that. We might have to absorb a little bit more money. But this is absolutely the right location. And, you know, the thing is, is that this is a really emotional issue for everybody sitting here because fire protection is very important to the city. And, and, and we, all, we all said when this whole thing started, number six has to be first. Well, it just happens that three, three firehouses were brought at the same time. I don't want to hold up any firehouse. But I want to push this one as hard as we can. Uh, Alderman McMinimum. Yeah, I can go yes with the contingency on this one. And, uh, Mayor, you're going to hold it until we have some affirmation well, we that it's environmentally right safe. And I also want to say that, you know, uh, I think nine alder persons voted two weeks ago for a real estate purchase that involved $1.6 million of um, upgrade of the property for a teen empowerment center, and I voted no to that. But I can vote yes for this because this is, this is by comparison, this is a half million dollars for public safety for a fire station. So that's the way I'm thinking on this. Now, I also want to just respond to Alderman Hanauer. Is he still here? So, yeah, we'd like to provide protection to the one third of Ward 10 that's um, south of. 
uh, the Interstate 72. But here's the thing, I'd like to do it in a cost-effective manner. So you mentioned the response time to get there, to get to, um, I think you mentioned uh, Piper Glen. You know how long it would take Chatham Fire Protection District to get to Piper Glen? Especially if they had the same technology we're using to modify the, the uh, traffic lights, it'd take four minutes to get to uh, Piper Glen from Chatham Protection District. So I can vote yes to uh, protection in the southwest part of Springfield if there's cost sharing with Chatham, if there's a intergovernmental agreement with Chatham. And let me also point out something else. I think some folks here uh, go to Spartan um, um, sports facility on Iron Bridge Road. There's a, a subdivision, Iron Bridge subdivision, very popular, 100 lots. $400,000 homes in there. You know how far it is away from Chatham Firehouse? Try seven minutes. It's not a concern out there. It's not a concern. But now, we in Springfield, we want to go in and build a Taj Mahal fire protection house. There'll be two minutes from Iron Bridge Road, from Iron Bridge subdivision. So the cost-benefit ratios here are all messed up from my point of view, and that's why I've been a no vote for most of these, but I can do a yes vote for, a, with the contingency on the environmental study for uh, station uh, on uh, aisle, uh, aisles and, uh, what is it? Station six. six. Thank you. And by the way, just last one comment, let's not forget that we have what's called a class one fire department. Right. Class one fire department. That means that we're in the top 1% of all the fire departments out there. And we just spent $6 million on equipment, which, you know, you fight fires with equipment, not with firehouses. But now we want to spend all this money on firehouses. I think we, you know, we wouldn't be a class one fire department if we were doing such a horrendous job on uh, what they call it, the, the response time. So. Uh, down the road, I think we're going to need this money that we're spending on firehouses for other purposes, and that's the other reason for um, what will become my no vote for, I think, um, Harold O'Shea Builders is outstanding, and they're represented here tonight. Um, so this has nothing to do with Harold O'Shea Builders. This has to do with how we spend our money and the cost-benefit ratio or some of these um, firehouses. The, the, the firehouse in Cokey Mill, that was a, kind of a close call for me, but this, this down in the southwest part, of Springfield to cover one third of Ward 10 when we don't even entertain discussions with Chatham Fire Protection is just insane to me. It just, it's just, it's just um, not thinking smart on government. So that's where I stand. Alderman Conley, then Alderman Hanauer. Oh, apologies, I should have. Okay, Alderman Hanauer. Real, real quick, again, we get back to, if you had in your ward, seven minute response, eight minute response, you would be going crazy. You would change your, if you switch places with me, Joe, you would be going absolutely crazy for the, for the firehouse out there. And you can say we can go with Chatham, and I'm sure that when, it, when, when th they roll too, because of the mutual aid stuff, uh, and is that correct, Chief? Correct. But, but and, and we, as we do with them, and I'm sure we roll at, at uh, Iron Bridge because from probably... What's the one off uh, Toronto Road there? Is there uh, out, the, the out in Chucks there? By Crow's Mill? Yeah. Yeah. It's 11, right? It was 11? Yeah, we, 11. Oh, Station, yeah. Right. Station so, 11. I so, thought you were asking but, which But we do that. But again, we get into this whole deal. If, if you had seven-minute response time, let's, let's take the Chatham Road one away, and maybe Chatham can run, run to Chatham Road. I want to do it, but do it smart with money. Well, I do too, Joe, but, but it's time. The, the movement is to the southwest. That's what the maps are showing. That's what the, that's what the, um, that's what the census Annexation. is showing. And we, yeah. we, need to, we need to put a firehouse out there. It's been that way for 20 years. So let Chatham pay for part of it. They don't live in Chatham. They pay Springfield taxes. But we're going to protect that's Chatham. That's stupid. Well, it's smart. Decento. Thank you. I love to see all this passion behind the Springfield Jesus. Fire Department. I absolutely <laughs> love it. Um, but I remember not too long ago where only three of us up here loved it. Three of us only, only three aldermen re remaining up here now. The council's changed a little bit, but 
There were only three of us that believed enough in the Springfield Fire Department to support your full budget. And that's just a fact. So I love to see the passion that I'm seeing tonight supporting oh, the Springfield Fire Department. Person. It's fantastic. <laughs> love it. That's why we can afford to build another station because right. we're staffed for 14 and we're building number 13 now. 14. Alderman Williams. Oh, yes. Um, Orchard Spalding Road, Springfield Road. Uh, I'm, I would have to defer to somebody who's, I'm not in charge of the road, well, so I don't know. somebody in here that can answer that question? Which part of it is Springfield? I'm, I'm sure that the, the land I mean, that I, we're I building on I know Woodside's on the east, but I'm yeah. speaking to the west where we're talking about doing this. You know, if it's the Springfield Road, and then I already know I drove it out I believe there. It's county and, road, and that actually. road, yeah, I know. So, uh, what's going to happen? We're going to be building the road next because you're going to say, "Oh, we got to fly, oh, we, but we got to have a better road." And I already know. It won't so, be me. guys, this is why I, you hear me. I know I'm the annexation king, but you know, <laughs> I'm just trying to say this is well, why they you. should be in because of what what the future looks like. Ralph, I'm not arguing about growth and that it ain't going southwest. The census told us that. We know all that. But you, when those people came, should have annexed them in, especially if you wanted a, a location like where you're talking, Chief. They pay for fire protection. It doesn't matter about the... They, they need to come into the city if we're going to invest. I got a whole northeast. I, I never bring it up, but I could. I could argue your seven minutes. I could do a whole lot. If you read that fire study, guess what's number four? What area? The northeast of Springfield. That's where part we're going of four next. and part of three. But I don't because I'm I'm trying to be a team player. Okay, then we put three on this side. Okay, they're gonna be on on the other side of veterans, and it just keeps going on and on and on with this stuff. But there's got to come a time when we take care of Springfield, and I feel like that location, like I said way back when them people was here. We can't, it just is inappropriate. You probably are going to do it anyway, like, like, like what normally happens. But guess what? People are watching and listening. That's all I'll say. Alderman Redpath. You know, I, the mayor has appointed me to be part of a committee that's uh, reviewing the consultant's report. And I can tell this, this, this body right now that there's a lot more changes that we're going to be bringing for the fire department, positive changes that are going to affect the east side, the west side, the north side, the south side. So, you know, these three firehouses are this issue, but just understand we do have plans in the works to do other things too. And it's and we can't reveal them yet because we're real, still in the conversation area, but the chief will tell you, the mayor will tell you that we're discussing everything. Um, any other discussion? Or is there an amendment? Um, I, I make the amendment to um, move this with the contingencies that we talked about um, with the mitigation efforts. So, second. Okay, move and second to Corporation Council. You want to formalize the <clears throat> amendment? Yeah, we would add language uh, indicating that the approval of the purchase is subject to the uh, final numbers related to the remediation efforts involving the uh, environmental concerns. Thank you. We'll put and it in appropriate language and make that a section of the ordinance. And the remediation would have to come back before City Council. That is correct. Any any expenditures, right. if you're in excess of fifty thousand, uh, obviously would come back in the form of contracts and so on. But I think right now what they're trying to do is to get uh, a clear understanding of the timeline because that's the one of the primary concerns is dealing with EPA. Uh, they are certain that they can address the environmental concerns as I understand it. The question is the exact timing. So we'll have better information on that as it progresses. They also indicated, uh, as I recall, that the uh, $480,000 number may be considerably less. They're not quite sure yet. So they gave a timeline and an estimate to fully implement a remediation effort that they believe EPA will approve. So that the detail of that is being worked on, if, if that's of some help. So any discussion on the amendment? All the women purchase? So did they give you a timeline? You just said that they're in process of... They, I think the chief had mentioned early on, or I think Director Bottoms had, 
that they gave anywhere from six months to 12 months to 18 months, depending on EPA, but there's going to be a discussion with some of the EPA people to see how that uh, can be uh, shortened, because the process is the same. Uh, they, there's just a lot of uh, bureaucratic uh, steps that they have to go through. That's part of the process that they are going to be working on. Now, Corporation Council, with all those months you just said, is there a cap on how much money we're spending within 12, 16 months? So that, that's going to have to come back to the council when they get some better information. Okay. All the women, Conley. Um, just real quickly, are we working with an environmental consulting firm on this? Who are we working with? And, Anders. Anderson, Anderson Environmental, or Anders, Anderson Anders, Engineering. Anders. Anders. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Oh, Alderman Donna. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just for clarification purposes, you know, I thought we were headed towards holding it until we could figure things out. And so I know there's contingencies, but does that mean we are not purchasing the property until we get the results of the environmental and we agree to the exact mediation cost? Right. Yes. So it has to come back. So it's essentially... The only, uh, excuse me, sorry, Alderman, um, if it's less than 50,000, then we'd move forward. You know, if, it's, if the mediation is less then, but the estimation's way above that. I just, I, I, what, what's the harm in holding it as you suggested, Mayor, and then we find out and then we have a well an informed discussion, everything's on the table. That's where I thought we were headed. That's what you suggested, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think it's a perception. I think it's uh, really codifies to the community as Alderman Gregory brought up uh, that we are you know, committed to this location and vetting it as much as possible. I think, uh, you know, they can, uh, I know Alderman Gregory can speak better than I can with regards to this. I think there's a fear factor that we're just postponing it and we're really not being committed to that location and really vetting it through. So I'll speak to him a little bit, but, you know, and, and, and Roy's is on man, but, you know, we don't try, I don't try to be, you know, he's, he's his own man, so I'll, I don't try to do this tit for tat west side east side stuff that's why i wanted to go with ralph on the icon thing so we can break it but we take a beating from our constituents about us speak not speaking up not fighting for our side of town the east side and 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 really like he said that at times goes all the way out to macarthur from the type of calls that we get the type of things that we deal with you know so we we took in steps for eight we bought land prepared the land we taking steps for the west uh, west side, having a meeting, all of this stuff. Have, I don't even think we bought the land for that yet, right? Have we bought we the land for the west side? We own it. Okay, so we own it. So so people see all of this movement, Chatham Road agreement. I voted for it. I'm I'm good with it. So we try to be team players, and, and that's that's just what we're trying to do is get things done. And the development portion of it for 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 that corridor is really really important. Possibly a school going down the street. Levin Street, right down the street. We definitely have more fires towards this inner core of the city, for sure. You know, so uh, along with heart attack and, 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 you know, the health disparities on this side of town are far greater than anywhere else in this town. So, you know, we have many, many reasons besides it being locked in and our men and things to really put priority on this. And and, and guess what? If it comes back $500,000 or whatever, you know, me and them, you know, we already disagree on it. He, he ain't going to spend it, but I do, you know, because it's that important to, to, to the community to, to, in my eyes. And, and, and you know, I, I got high hopes for, for our community, and, and I apologize about that. But it, it is what it is. I ain't never going to change it. So. Thank you. All the women in Desenzo. This is a firehouse that I've personally been fighting for for years. When all the changes started coming about, no one came to me. No one. No one said, no, we're, it's going to go to 11th and Ash now. It's not going to be in Ward 6 anymore. It's going to be in Ward 2. I don't really care where it is. I want it to be safe. And putting firefighters on top of contaminated soil and possibly water and everything else, that's not safe. That's a, that's a bad idea. So if we're just going to have this conversation all over again, why would we, would we just not hold on to this? Hold vote. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. say nay. No. No. Motion passes. 
So on the ordinance as amended, any discussion? Or is there a motion? Motion to uh, pass, final passage. Second. Good moving. Second, any discussion? Just uh, Mr. Merritt, real briefly. Yeah. Alma McMinnville. You and Corporation Council might want to consider an option to purchase on this property as, uh, as another idea. Uh, an option to purchase at a low price. You can just think about that and bring it back to the council. But on a yes vote on this, I meant uh, ordinance tonight. Are you saying that it re re reduce the price or? Well, it'd have to be negotiated. But, uh, right. Just that's an idea. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion as amended, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. I vote yes. There you go. Oh, thank you. All the well, sorry about that. I thought I punched it. Hang on, yeah. Sorry. And the motion passes as amended. Eight voting yes, two voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-208, an ordinance authorizing a professional services agreement with Harold O'Shea Builders for That's construction right. management and oversight of, for the construction of three fire station locations for a total amount not to exceed $895,000 for the Office of Budget and Management. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-208 on final pass. So move. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? Yes. So... Alderman Williams. Does this address locations or just they're going to build three firehouses? Or is the locations built into this? Uh, it's the three firehouses, not the locations. Thank you. Is that correct, Count, Counselor? And Mike O'Shea is here. Uh, if you, anybody has any questions? Mike. <laughs> Thanks A long for meeting. Uh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> too, Mike. Line. Alderman McMinimum. Just, uh, I have complete confidence in O'Shea Builders, but I've never been in favor of three firehouses, so I'm just being consistent with the budget vote and other votes. Yep, Mike, if you would mind uh, coming up and just giving an overview of uh, going this direction and the benefits of, of that, that'd be helpful. Yeah, so uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, probably as many of you recognize in a lot of other aspects in your world, it is a very volatile marketplace right now. And I think this provides an opportunity to consolidate some purchasing across the firehouses and um, also make sure that uh, we do some pre-purchasing of items to try and get ahead of things. And all that will happen through a competitive bidding process. And also uh, we think we can run the three stations together to drive some economy into the bidding process. Uh, both in terms of economy of scale and workflow that uh, will create an interest among a number of bidders and, and, and hopefully uh, really keep this in an affordable price range. Also, um, we'll work with the architect as they work through design to make sure that uh, we're part of the selection process in terms of making wise choices about materials and so forth to control costs. And again, one of our challenges through all this will be making sure that we are selecting materials that are going to be available within the time constraints that we have. And that world's very different than it was even six or eight months ago. So um, I'm not sure how much you'd like me to go on tonight, but maybe if you have other more specific questions, I could address those. Um, Any other questions or comments? Well, we thank you for sticking around and thank you. giving thank the you. overview. Appreciate Glad to do it. Thank you. All in favor of the ordinance, uh, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. Not, not clicking there, but oh, I'm a yes. Jensen is a yes. Yes. And the uh, ordinance passes nine voting yes, one voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2022-213, ordinance to increase the number of Class D liquor licenses by uh, one for Capital City Baseball LLC doing business as Lucky Horseshoes located at 1415 North Grand Avenue East for emergency passage. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-213. Final passage. So moved. Second. And moved and second. Do you want me to Any discussion? Yeah. Just very briefly, the reason for the emergency passage is uh, their season starts June 4th. So that would be before the next council meeting. So this is for a restaurant uh, liquor license. <coughs> Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. <coughs> Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. I vote 
vote. Present. The ordinance passes 10 voting yes, one voting present. Next item on the agenda is 2022-214, an ordinance authorizing the acceptance of RFP number HR 23-04 for a two-year agreement with PSI Services LLC, an amount not to exceed $125,000 for entry-level exams for police and fire departments uh, from May 17, 2022 through May 17, 2024 for the Office of Human Resources for Emergency Passage. So no moved. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2022-214 on final passage. It's been moved and second. Any discussion? All those, mm -mm. all those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. Mayor, who was second? Oh. Or Chuck. You can't vote for him, Mr. Williams. <laughs> and the uh, ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Is there any uh, unfinished business come before the City Council? All the one to purchase? Yes, thank you. Um, Mayor, I know that we have a pop up party task force. And this weekend, we had um, over several pop-up parties that occurred. And I wanted to thank the Springfield Police Department for, we were spread it very thin, over 184 calls on Saturday night. And I have one of my neighborhood presidents that attended that first pop-up party. And uh, some of the tow truck companies, a lot of people are asking, when is the task force coming back together? And I think this weekend kind of woke us up. And so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Well, I know you know about it, but bring it to everyone's attention and ask Deputy Chief Josh to speak. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, we did have a uh, very busy weekend, um, especially Saturday night. I think you all saw the press release that we put out yesterday, reference some of those activities. And I think uh, the message we sent, you know, both with our enforcement action that night and the press release yesterday is that we're not going to tolerate these parties, um, the traffic stops that occurred as a result of these parties moving around throughout the city, I think they probably touched somewhere in everyone's ward. Um, you may not have been aware of it uh, because we did not let it sit and grow to the size that it was um, last year and previous years. Um, our officers, um, they did, I mean, you can't say enough about what the men and women of the Springfield Police Department do for us every night, um, but that night they adapted, they moved with the parties. They uh, used their intelligence resources to find where the parties had moved to, got there, you know, in timely fashion when, before all of the other cars got there and they were able to move them on. And unfortunately, those individuals decided to just move that party to another location, again, throughout the city. Um, and we have some of those locations if you'd like to know, but uh, it did continue to move. And we were able to do that without any significant use of force, without any major incidents involving us. Um, and we can do all of the planning, meet with all of the communities, um, our fellow partners in law enforcement, um, but without the men and women out there doing it every night and adapting to it, that was a key piece of Saturday night's uh, keeping it safe. Well, I think too, Deputy Chief Josh, that it helps for the community to be brought and involved in it with the task force so that we're able to go back to our neighborhoods and also try to help you because this is a community effort when they first see the first few cars pulling up. You know, quick and easy, they are very, very frustrated on North Grand. This is like their fourth time having to close down. She's afraid that people, the windows will get busted if they lock the door. So just trying, I, I don't even know what to say at this point of how we can move forward, but I know bringing us back to the table may help with some ideals from the different neighborhoods. We've been very focused you know, early on this year in getting with our law, enfor law enforcement partners, um, meeting with um, Public Works for barricades, um, CWP for getting up some of our camera systems, and I think the next step, we'd absolutely love to meet with uh, the, the uh, business owners. You know, as we saw with this one, it wasn't just the parks that right. had been, and uh, you know, North Grand, which we had set up a camera for. Right, thank um, you. In expectation of that, they went to other businesses and other parking lots. And so meeting with some of those affected business owners will be key moving forward. Yeah, and I know we can't openly discuss every plan of action that we have. This is not the place to format for it. So I just wanted to make sure that we that everyone knew it was an urgency for the police department and the pop-up task force party, uh, task force to get together as soon as possible. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I know uh, we got uh, calls about Comer <coughs> Cox Park. They really appreciate the uh, expediency of the uh, police department's response out there. So thank yes, you very much. Yes, we had much. met in advance with the park district. They had a uh, officer who was working and was present out there at the time when those cars began to show up. So we were <coughs> notified very early and got those cars moved along. So. Thank oh, you. I'm not done um, while you're up here. Um, I, I would say this falls under old business because it just passed, but while you're standing here, I would like to thank the Springfield Police Department, my older sister, Kristen DeCenso, um, Springfield JCs, the Cons Hospitality Group. We even had uh, Mayor, our SIU alumni girls who are here on internships that came out to help us with cleaning up the neighborhoods, and last but not least, our neighbors. It was an amazing turnout. We got to interact with neighbors and the community <coughs> that didn't show up but wanted to get involved, and people kept stopping us back and forth. And they thought it was pretty cool for the police department and the chief of police to be out there with yes. us. So I do thank you all for taking the time to be there with us on Saturday morning. It meant a lot to us. Sorry I couldn't make it. I was glad. Uh, you know, I know that we had other individuals that were there, including the chief. Yeah. So we're glad to be there. Our MPOs, too. We had both of our MPOs out as well. And I thank you for partnering with me on my first one to get me straight and make sure that, you know, everything worked. And thank you, Public Works uh, Director Harris, too, um, Adina, for getting us our bags, our um, pickers. We need some more of those pickers because all of my, my people use the pickers. They Don't waste not. your time on the pickers. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, it really worked out. Thank you so much. Alderman Williams? Yes. Uh, so uh, I, I would like a request of the of the council of the of us that we be consistent with our. Um, I need a plan. I need to. I need to know more uh, and, and be weary of of a cost because uh, Sean kind of hit on what, what we face when we go back and and I'm starting to feel like anytime something is east or benefits the east, we get that. <sighs> Where's your budget, or do you have a plan? I really need to know more, and what about it? And did this firehouse, for example, may hit 500, yet we easily, you know, buy some planters and plants for 600 and some thousand for downtown. Uh, people are listening and watching, and then they're asking me, well, ain't that public safety what y'all trying you know? And then on the other hand, y'all gonna spend 600 and some thousand dollars for plants and trees, for around the downtown area. But it's an issue because that firehouse is gonna cost, we just need to be a little more conscious. And if you're gonna ask the questions of where's your plan, where's your budget, uh, you should be the same way about the other things that happen that we spend up here that a lot of time cost more because when I look at it, I see pennies compared to what some of these other, I mean, it could be anything from doing three houses that came up. Again, $400,000, and we grilled, grilled, grilled to the ground and talked about and questioned to death about it failed, it got put in committee, but yet there's other things that cost much more and it, and it just goes through. So I just want us to be conscious of what maybe it feels like on this side when this happens over and over and over. Alderman Williams, I'm the, uh, one, I'm the one who originally brought up wards, the, the Station 6 house. I've been talking about it for years, before you were sitting there. This is not a new topic. So please don't... I, I, I didn't mention ward, I mean... No, station I'm six. just saying, but, but that's what you're talking about. And as the third east side alderman, I would like to, to say that, you know, this we're, we're questioning this because you, we could buy land for cheaper elsewhere, and there's environmental concerns. That's why we're questioning it. We're not questioning it because well, the cost is a factor, but we're, we're questioning the safety of it for our safety providers, for, our, for the, the, the men and women who keep the city safe. So, I mean, not everything is a west side, east side issue. It just for, isn't. For, for you, speak for yourself. For no, me, I'm the, you, to, you, you told me last week I'm the third east side alderman. And, yes. and you, like, I didn't know that. Yes. Like, like, I'm well, you said you was the urban oh, alderman the or something. You're you the know. lake. I'm the third east You're the lake. That's right. He's the furthest east side. So this, I mean, not everything's a fight. It just, it just no, isn't. No, no, I'm not, I'm not and saying And I understand what you're either. saying. My, my difference with you is so if you had your way, it'd still be going west, right? No. No, your, your, your pick out no. there by Darcy's Pint 
Well, that's west of the current location. Yes that's, or no? Listen, that's barely west. Oh, and it's south. Barely. It's, it's still southwest. Going, it's, <laughs> which is where the population so is moving. It's Ralph's, common sense. Right, Ralph's it's is common south sense. west, too. Well, I'm sure mine isn't anywhere is. near Ralph's. Yep, Alderman Gregory. <laughs> oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, just a couple short notes. Nothing I, I want to talk about, but um, our, our tree pickup um, and and our leaf pickup, Mr. Harris. If we could just make a note um, to spot check in the Bum Park area um, a little bit. Um, it just hasn't been done. Um, but I do thank uh, Miss 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 Adina. Um, and I may be saying her name wrong, but I, I, I do thank her because she did come around and, and um, you know, for our community, right, I, I fuss about this 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 um, liquor store on, on what, Stewart and Martin Luther King a lot and the people that, that stand behind there. But they joined in on the cleanup and cleaned up their own mess, you know, and it, and it really was a, a good opportunity to network. I, I talked to Chief Scarlett and stuff, and, I you know, I, I'm going to push for our officers and, you know, city people to get out over there as well um, because it, it was an opportunity that we missed to really grow. Um, and, yeah, you know, they, they, they went and bought them a beer with a few bucks that I bought them. And, but um, <laughs> it, it, it is what it is. But, but the thing about it is they engage with the community. The lady from across the street, you know, uh, um, who, who definitely doesn't like them there, she, she was able to see them pick up after themselves and, and really try to keep the area um, together. So while we were, you know, little in numbers, we definitely got, got a mighty deed done. Um, I would just like to um, say, Mr. Mayor, I know we had a, um, I, I put in the budget for our revitalization program. I think that's going to help some groups out. Um, I did speak to uh, Ms. Adina, too, in Public Works, just about, Daryl, Mr. Harris, uh, if you can make a note about people who have adopted streets, um, like the Langfelder family over there by Brailer, um, <laughs> sent out some notices that, you know, I think there's like a rule three times to get out and stuff like that. And, and, and I want to see those groups, you know, get out. And if not, let's, let's let somebody else get up there and, and, and do their job. Um, I think that's important. Railroad grass is terrible along 19th Street. Normally, we got to tell them every year. So um, that's it. Um, I appreciate everybody. And former Alderman Bose really appreciates that last comment about Railroad tracks and the weeds. So thank you for bringing do. that up. I bet he do. I bet he do. Alderman Redpath. Real quick, I just wanted to follow up with the chief. I appreciate the detail that you guys put together. I don't know what the logistics are with your uh, counterparts, but I, I see that we intercepted some bad actors from Decatur and Bloomington and that kind of thing. And that's been a problem for years. Uh, a lot of the insight that goes on over here is, is caused by that. Absolutely. Uh, several of the people that uh, we arrested this weekend with firearms had come in from other communities. That will be a focus of uh, future details. Um, helping out with us will be the state police. County has reached out. And I'm sure other local agencies. The license plate included. readers, I think, are, are going to be very uh, mm -hmm. I think it will be very helpful to identify some of those individuals when we do have incidents that, uh, that occur Thank in you. our jurisdiction. Thank you. Alderman Hanauer. Yeah, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Public Works. Um, it's needless to say, we've all had a lot of complaints about grass. Um, I thought, and and uh, I thought at one point we we changed the ordinance to where it's progressive discipline. If they if they if we keep getting called out on on a group on a, on a, a homeowner or a, a landowner or something, um, I've got some that. Every year, they will not mow until we call them. Mm. And I had some grass that it's still out there. I think Daryl sent people out today, They're literally 14 inches high, and it's the same people all the time. And I, I don't know whether I, I, I would like to look into that ordinance because I don't know whether we reset it at the end of the year, but I think it's time to stop resetting it. And if, if they get warned, that's their warning. The next time they're going to get a ticket if we go out. Whether they mow it after we, we cite them or not, we got to pick up for our, our um, staff time. And, um, but we have the same people every year. And I guarantee you, every, every one of us probably knows who they are, you know, in, in, your, in your wards. And if, if you could look into that uh, ordinance, I can't remember because I know I was one of the sponsors. 
we I think we need to 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 get a little harder on on people because we shouldn't have to call some of these out of town developers or whatever every spring and tell them to mow the grass. But thanks, Daryl. Thank you to you, your staff, and I appreciate that. Alderman Purchase. Thank you. Um, I wanted to respond to Alderman Williams about my planters and my trees. Um, we did explain the process, and you're always open to ask questions if you want to. But um, I, I call and ask my colleagues for support, so that's why it, you know, it happened, and it was something that was done before me. So when you just brought up like downtown, I got to fight for all my businesses too, and they want to see that type of stuff as well, and that's why a plan was brought forward. Uh, do you, is that a question or you want me to respond because I'm willing you can what respond you back to oh, me it's, a, it's both it's dialogue back and forth huh? y'all text each other well yeah I mean if I didn't call you by name I said, no, what, said I said what we spent money on we spent 600 and some thousand which dollars ward, on, which is in my ward so that's right. why I'm acknowledging and addressing it because it's okay. in ward five okay. that's all and I'm just saying without mentioning names I ask that everybody treat these projects a little more fair because there wasn't, a, you know, the same kind of questioning about that. And, and it's not about lobbying what you want. It's about doing the right thing and prioritizing uh, what should be done. I'm not against the flowers and the trees and none of that. I voted for it. But just like I voted for it, I expect votes to come back, too, without so much heartburn and, and, and drilling that we get. Okay. And then on to finish on a good note. I wanted to say um, great job to Director Scott Dahl. We had over 30 representatives for the Illinois Council of Convention and Visitors Bureau here for their spring meeting, um, you know, 2022. And it, it went really, really well. And thank my colleagues and the mayor for coming out yesterday. I had a blast with everyone. And the number one thing, the number one takeaway they had was just being appreciated that they were able to go, get through the pandemic and still be able to go back to each and every one of their cities throughout the, the state of Illinois and be able to produce through our education and marketing tools that we have. So great job, Director Scott. Very good. Any uh, new business come before the council? All the women purchase? I have a lot tonight, don't I? Good. It's a busy uh, weekend. Yes, it is. So coming up, we have, hold on one second. I don't want to miss out on anything. Very busy weekend. Um, Saturday, we have our farmer's market ribbon cutting at 9 a.m. And the whole city council is invited to come and attend with us, too. Uh, we'll be saying a few words. And then we have cake provided after that by Incredible Delicious. And then that follows into our uh, Pride Fest, which the parade starts at 1130. And I wanted to give a very huge shout out and congratulations to DSI because they're in Richmond, Virginia right now. Mm -hmm. But they also just took third place as a winner of 2021 2022 shop small neighborhood champion innovation contest that was presented by american express in partnership with main street america and um, they want to use our study and how we do our main street momentum on main street here um, as a u.s study so i thought that was pretty cool and i just wanted to say congratulations to dsi and that we're making some progress downtown yeah, that was for the, if you remember, during the holiday walks and all of that, DSI puts on the Memorial Health Services sponsored Festival of Trees downtown. But uh, they really uh, received special recognition for the uh, Illinois products that were displayed on the Jackson Street uh, corridor and the Y Block. So we made good use of that, and yeah. now it's going to be used nationally. Yep, and please join us for also the Capital Art Fair, too. That'll be following in the afternoon as well. It'll be some cool, neat features out there. I have, like, these welded plants there. It's so cool. They, like, weld different animals and different flowers that you could put in your front yard, and it's unique. So I encourage everyone to come out and um, spend your money, patronize. And that's on Saturday and Sunday. Alderwoman DeCento. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. All right, next person. Can it's, I that, it's that late. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> well, on a little bit of a somber note, we actually uh, lost two uh, important pe people recently that uh, had an impact on the city. One was um, 
uh, former treasurer Judy Madonia uh, passed away, and she was the uh, actually a treasurer, I believe, under the old commission form of government, and then the uh, first treasurer on this form of government, and then also uh, Dick Hart, who was you know he's deemed as um, you know one of the uh, most knowledgeable people with regards to the city's history. He's very instrumental in uh, preserving the Elijah Isles House and then uh, also a first citizen. So we just take a moment of silence for both of them. We would uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. I remember. Any, oh, great. Yes. All the woman descends up. Um, the Urban Forestry Commission is very busy out planting trees, and we had an incident over uh, uh, late Sunday night, early Monday morning. Is there any way to inform residents if you're going to be planting around their homes or, um, you know, in the boulevard, which I realize is city-owned, but is there any way to notify people? Because what we don't want is these trees being destroyed for no reason. Um, it's my understanding there was a confrontation when these trees were being planted. If it were me, I'd say, okay, we're not going to plant the tree here. So eight trees were completely destroyed because someone didn't want a tree there. And um, I would just, <laughs> I'd like to avoid this in the future, if at all possible. I did. Thank you for your concern. I did uh, bring that up. Uh, I believe you had a conversation with our arborist, uh, to Mr. Reem. And he did concur with you. They will do a better job of making sure they put that information out there to the public. Again, as you know, that uh, particular commission does a great job of providing trees. You know what yes. trees do to the environment. I believe our city was the city that also won uh, in, a, in, the, in a national uh, recognition as far as what we do as far as trees and planting trees and preserving trees. So, again, they do a yeoman job. And, yes, Jeff did take on your concerns and will I'll be enforcing those. Thank you for that uh, update. Thank you very much. Alderman Donlin. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just on a much lighter note, I, I uh, although she will not be happy I did this, I just want to wish my daughter a happy birthday. <gasps> oh, good job. Aww. Oh, she's not watching anyway. She's not a teenager yeah. anymore. <laughs> uh, we not do have an executive anymore. session to discuss uh, contracts and potential litigation. So, do you want to make that oh, motion? Come on. Is there a second? Okay. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. We're adjourned for executive session. You can we'll speak read. when we we'll come, come back, back in. and redeem. No, it's not. Come on, everyone, sit down. Let's go. No, it's not. Oh, it's not over. What? It's not over yet. It's not, that's true.
Windsor. Motion to reconvene the regular city council meeting. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Uh, city council is resumed. And then um, I think we have a couple people signed up to speak. First is uh, Miranda Smith. Oh, we can come back. Bridget Flynn. You state your name and address for the council. We'd appreciate it. My name is Bridget Flynn, and I will keep it brief, and I will be clear that my intent with this is to respectfully request that the city provide some sort of recycling um, service for residents because I have, um, I'm new to town, I've been here a month and a half, and I have been very happy with Springfield, but I have been very disappointed to find that I have no way to recycle, not even to drop items off. I am a renter, um, I rent in an apartment downtown. My landlord is unwilling to provide any recycling services. Um, he, uh, he uses uh, Republic, for trash collection, and he's unwilling to sign up for recycling services. I even offered to pay for the recycling services. He's unwilling. Um, and apparently Republic has some sort of drop-off location, but that um, is not an option because I called Republic on May 10th, and somebody named Kelly there told me that there is no point in taking items to their drop-off location because they just take items from there to the landfill. <laughs> Um, yeah, and numerous people have suggested to me that I take my items to lake area disposal. That's also not an option because I've called there. I spoke with somebody named Lorne on April 19th. I also went there and they have made it crystal clear that they will not accept recyclables from somebody who does not have a trash account with them. So, and I've also con contacted the city and somebody named Tiffany there told me that they offer no recycling services. So, um, I've been very, um, saddened by this. I, I moved to spring field to be an environmental attorney to try to do my part for this planet and so it's been pretty disappointing and, and frankly heartbreaking to find out I have no way to recycle so I would really really appreciate it if you could do something for us well we appreciate that and if uh, you give your name and number to Daryl Harris we can uh, fall back up with you and also with the waste haulers and see what we can work out thank you very briefly have you talked with the Dana Rivas he's she's our recycling coordinator no, I did not know there was With a all the, uh, okay, waste haulers. Okay. Other woman Conley. Hi. Thank you. I just want to thank you for staying four hours to yes. speak to this. Yes. It's a, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it really is. It's an important topic, and I appreciate We wrote up in the elevator together, and I, I would have warned you if I had known what you were heading into. Um, quickly, I'll be quickly. Uh, yeah, you best be. Just to, I will, real quick. So the, uh, we do have three locations, and three locations is uh, for each of the haulers. Lake area is 6th Street behind Habitat. Restore uh, for waste management is Ash Street. This is the transfer station, and for the public services on Sand Hill Road at the Sangamon County Landfill, um, they can go to those, those particular uh, entities. Your particular address, I'm sorry, is uh, actually should be going to the um, Sand Hill to um, Sangamon County Landfill. You should use your address at 707 South Second Street. Uh, we had confirmed that. There's a large dumpster there, and it's not a misconception is because it's a dumpster, it's going to the landfill. Actually, it's not. We get a data sheet of the recyclable items that are going to each of those locations, and we get a uh, report back to make, to make sure that they're actually going to recyclable plants. So we have locations for your items. I have a card for Adina Riva. I'll send to you, uh, give to you as well. If you have any issues, please contact me as well. Great. Thank, Thank you, Daryl. Thank, Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, next is Miranda Smith, and you'd come up and state your name and address for the council. We'd appreciate it. And if uh, you direct comments to the chair, I should uh, remind everybody and keep comments five minutes. We'd appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor and Councilman. Members, um, my name is Miranda Smith, and I am with Emerald Gardens Nonprofit. Uh, we are a newly founded uh, organization dedicated to uh, helping communities and offering fresh produce to food pantries, shelters, and other outreach organizations. 
Our goal is to provide services and programs within a 50 mile radius of Awanico, Illinois um, within the first five years um, and then expanding to the central Illinois area as we continue our services. We want to make an impact by using food production as a pathway to encourage life's changes and rehabilitation of our communities for our citizens. I believe that our communities have a lot of topics at hand <laughs> that uh, we always have a passion in discussing. And I believe that if we can unite our communities and uh, all of the individual organizations, we can make uh, um, impact as a whole. We currently are discussing uh, or in discussion with um, different uh, communities and organizations. We have three of the Memorial Hospital locations that we have uh, reached out to to try to access um, and influence more of the community base. We have uh, currently 12 food pantries that we are going to be helping and uh, five outreach programs along with many more additional networks that we hope to um, achieve and that are in progress. We hope to connect our communities in combined effort to manage resources effectively and efficiently. Um, recycling is definitely a topic that uh, was just mentioned that we believe and have a passion for at Emerald Gardens. I have 18 acres that I am converting into uh, this nonprofit and in the future would like to house recycling education and manufacturing of upcycling programs along with using the food production as a pathway for those that um, want to rehabilitate and make life changes um, We are using teachable moments to cultivate intentional community. I believe that it is very difficult for communities to unify. I mean, even here tonight, we've had several discussions that uh, I would like to bring to the table to where Springfield, Decatur, Effingham, Taylorville, um, the central Illinois population can come together as a whole. Um, my vision for Emerald Gardens is to become a place where um, memories today impact and inspire change for tomorrow. Um, all of the choices that we make are in due process for the next generation and being aware of that is extremely important. Um, I appreciate your time and letting me speak and if there are any questions or information that you would like to have, I have additional handouts and informational packets along with our executive summary. Thank, Thank you, you and I appreciate Thank your you time. Pass those out or if you want to uh, that. I would like with one. the clerk. Thank you. <clears throat> I think each person take a packet if you like. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. You. Next, we have uh, Heather Lochte. You come up and state your name and address for the council. We'd appreciate it. Again, if direct the uh, comments to the chair as well as keep it to five minutes, we'd appreciate it. Hello, Congressmen and women, uh, Mr. Lesko and the Corporate Council and Mayor. My name is Heather Leakty, and before I start, I arrived into the city about 5.30, and I got a text that said it's National Police Awareness a Week, so it said thank the police officers <laughs> if you see them, so I, I genuinely mean that, so thank you, uh, for protecting uh, the city of Springfield Thank and otherwise. Um, I am here tonight. I was hoping I wouldn't have to be. However, uh, things did not get resolved in the manner. And so I wanted to come over with Michael Stract, my fiance, and um, Discuss, uh, tell you about me. We, you know, you, I will unfortunately be here probably every other week. Uh, I was hoping this would get resolved because this isn't uh, something I enjoy. 
However, I am a public school teacher of 25 years. I teach special education. Um, I spent many of my years over at Danville High School. I taught the students with behavior disorders and the emotionally disturbed. Um, generally, that's about a three-year burnout rate, and I did it for about 18. Um, the, the, it was a, a difficult and challenging job, um, but one that requires a lot of patience, a lot of love and understanding. Uh, I also would like you to know that I am a mother of two children. My oldest attends DePaul University. Uh, he chose that because he wants to go to law school there. He has worked under Judge Valdez up at the Chicago uh, court, federal courthouse. He's also interned uh, with Senator Duckworth. My daughter, Molly, just graduated from the U of I on Sunday uh, with a journalism degree major, and she would love to be an investigative reporter one day. So the reason that I am speaking to you is I'm speaking about my credibility. I am just an absolutely normal, uh, everyday person. I'm a common folk, good heart, try to help, um, kind to others. I am a patriot. I do believe in our Constitution, and I would help anybody. One might say I might be a rooter of the underdog always, but I'm, I'm good with that. Um, I, I had a meeting with, with Jim um, concerning Michael a few weeks ago. And, and I had mentioned, um, you know, the situation that was presented on the radio as we drove in. And we had John, the inspector general, um, kind of snickering on the radio about how this isn't very important. However, it's not as important if it's not your life that's being exposed and, and destroyed, you know, and that's the sad thing. It's not a laughing matter uh, about anyone. Um, and my, I, I snickered myself because uh, the news guy was laughing like, oh, this is just uh, really pretty funny, like this isn't anything. And then he would break and talk, and then he'd pop back onto the city council. And he's like, for not being, you know, for this guy not being very important, he's still talking about it. Break, and he, you know, would talk some more and get back on with you guys. Oh, not very important, but he's talking about it. I was in a meeting with Jim, the, the corporation council, and Michael, and they were discussing. They had had a... Uh, a three-hour meeting with the police chief, with, I believe, Frank Lesko, and three hours about Michael. In this hour afterwards, Michael was threatened to come to this meeting three times in an hour. And I left saying, Michael, why is it that people want to stifle your speech? What, like, I felt threatened. He, you know, why, 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 are, why do people want to arrest him for speaking the truth? It's not made up. He, he's like, for me, the modern day uh, Abraham Lincoln. He does not have a law degree, but the man knows the law, and he will challenge. I mean, he knows his rights. He knows his laws, and that's not a bad thing. If more people did, it would be wonderful. But as we were speaking to Jim, it was a threat. You will be arrested if you show up. And I said, why? Well, if you, you would, know, uh, if, well, here's and, the. And, what, and, and my question if you direct was. direct it to me, what, please. What, sorry? If you wrap it up in a minute. Yeah, but yeah, you can yeah. Direct the so comments that, to me. you know, I, I will, yes, thank, thank you. you. And, and I appreciate that. Everybody's tired. I will end it 
we, we will be back because we will, you know, I need to be his eyes and ears and he won't be silenced and he will do it in the most respectful way. You know, there's not gonna, he's a great man. I wouldn't be at his side if I didn't believe him. The evidence is there, guys, and uh, you just can't run for it. I know it's wanting to be on the hush and the, the down low, but it's there, and I wish that somebody would please. I mean, for me. There's, uh, with regards to uh, tonight, Thanks, uh, yeah, attorneys. it went a little far on the Inspector General's report, so I apologize for that. Um, with regards to your options, really, court is one of them, you know, that you can explore, we, but the other option is our Civil Service Commission. Because yeah, we're just a uh, legislative body, but that's where you need to take that. And they meet monthly, so if um, Corporation and, and Council we, yeah. can set that up for you, if you'd uh, like to pursue through Civil Service Commission, I'm just other afraid. than that, it'd have to be with the courts over at Sangamon County. Yeah, and I understand what, what you're saying, but this is a public forum, and I can promise you that we will be everything. back. Yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Uh -huh. Am I next? Uh, nope. Well, you have to sign up. I, I nobody's. Did. I do. Okay. I submitted. Okay. Five minutes. That's be no, 10 minutes. Point of order. He's out of It'll order. Be five minutes. Ten minutes on Mary's out of order. What's that? He's out of order. Did he sign up? I have. I have no sign up. So I have. We, I signed up. Motion. Oh, that's oh, he's uh, waited four hours. I'll give you five minutes. Just direct oh, your comments to me. Come on, you got to quit doing this. Yeah, I know exactly. We do. This is direct so, them to me. Um, and, uh, first don't, off, oh, don't first make off. anything personal. Okay. I'm trying not to, sir. Okay. Thank you for my time. Uh, that would have been an open meetings violation if I wasn't given it. First off, I would put out my phone number is four four seven five two nine zero nine nine nine. That is so any attorney in the Springfield area that wants to look at my case. I will give 100% of the award that I get to them. I am not here for the money. I'm here for accountability that Frank Let's Go says that a class three felony. If you just once again, direct me, please. Okay, your <laughs> clerk, Frank Let's Go, said that a class three felony is worth a verbal warning. So I will be back every week. Now let's talk about the IG. So the IG said that I did nothing for three years. Actually, I did something. I contacted the Sangamon County State's Attorney's Office, Dan Wright. And tonight, if I was given access to your monitors, which I was told that it's a rule that says I can't have access, which is a violation of the Open Meetings Act as well. But uh, if I was given access to those, you would see emails to Dan Wright way before the statute of limitations was up. And then you'd see emails to the Illinois State Police Investigative Bureau and the Sangamon County Sheriff's Department and the Springfield Police Department. I mean, I, I told everybody well before, well before the statute of limitations was up, but Dan Wright backdoored me. He contacted each of those organizations and said, do not investigate this. I was told that by the chief of police last time I was here. Oh, yeah, I know the backstory in this. There's no crime. Dan Wright says there's no crime. Dan Wright held up my statute of limitations. But the good news is, is that the last event that Rex Range participated in against me was in 2020, the summer. So really, three years from then, we're still within that statute of limitations, aren't we? So we really could do something as a legislative body. What I'm asking for tonight... is an assignment of a special counsel into this. This is a constitutional issue. We really need to have a special counsel. Your IG did not do anything. He made phone calls. Hey, did you really do this on your break? Well, today I got a new email because I did another FOIA request on another agency that he did, and it wasn't the same day as the other one. Uh-oh, sounds like maybe more breaks instead of one break. Maybe he just lied to the inspector general. Maybe that's what you can fire him for now. He's a liar. He has lied to your investigating officer. Anybody want to do anything about that? I mean, without accountability, we cannot have a country. We cannot have a constitutional republic. 
I'm going to be here every week as soon as I get access to those monitors, which will probably be an ACLU thing. I guess I'm going to have to contact somebody about that because Frank says it's in the rules. I couldn't find it. I read your rules. There's nothing in the rules. That's taxpayer funded. I get access to that next time or there will be some kind of action. I don't want to go to court. I'm trying to stay out of court. I'm just trying to ask you guys to get some accountability into your government. Do the right thing. In this case, you can uh, go to court, like you said. Well, I don't want to go to court. I still have my time, too. Okay, so. go ahead. Thank you. I, I, I agree. <laughs> it, it, that's all it's been, sir, is silence this guy. We're not silent. Today. Well, you're not. You're not going I to. I have not given you Not any going to either because no. I'm going to continue to no. be here every day no. until, until I am satisfied that something was done or because it's an election year, people understand that the people that are elected – have chosen not to do their constitutional duty and protect the Constitution. So I'm going to go ahead and submit this paper to the clerk. This is all the forms you need to get a special counsel. I would hope that somebody seconds that or first it or whatever you guys do. The reality is, is we need an independent investigation into this. Statute of limitation has not ran its course on this. It hasn't. Your attorney can tell you it has, and everybody else will say that too, but I don't trust your court systems here because I've been wronged in those two. We're not over the court system. And you, I know that. That's the same. I, I address the Sangamon County as well. You're right. Absolutely. And they got all the evidence because I didn't know that I could submit a package until now. So they got all the evidence. And my last thing is, is how did my court records get out of the courthouse in Rex Range's hands? Online. No, they're not. No, court records are not, okay? The court has available records, but not the records that I had. And they were unredacted with all of my data. Rex Range then, this is how he did it too. He went to the courts, got the, got the information. Then he went to the state police or the, yeah, the, the, the criminal access computer with a deputy. He found out all the counties that I had problems in because there's 103. So he did that on a break apparently. Your point of order, and then, we've gone over five minutes. Right and I'm trying to wrap it up. I can tell that you guys. We've That's gone right. over your five this minutes. In our purview. Go ahead. Um, do you understand? We can't Bill, do anything uh, direct, here. Direct, go ahead and finish your statement. I interrupted then, you after your five minutes were up. Yeah, you all yeah. saw. We can hear you. Okay, so <laughs> he got my court records. He got the information. He got my date of birth. It was in an email to, to the, my, Monticello. The, all my private information was in an email under his official title. So you they thought that. that they were working with an official of Springfield. That's official misconduct on his part. So your two options are take that up with the county. They I'll be back next time to speak again on the matter. Or civil service. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. You. Is there a motion for adjournment? So Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Or adjourn. Right Because I, I was going to follow up, I didn't sit down.